Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the November 14th, 2019, 7 p.m. special meeting of the Planning Commission for the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, we'll call this meeting to order. And Tess, could you do a roll call, please? Commissioner Schifrin? Here. Conway? Spellman? Here. <clears throat> Nielsen? Here. Greenberg? Here. Singleton? Here. Chair Pepping? Present. And uh, count. Uh, Commissioner Conway is absent with uh, notification. Are there any statements of qualification, disqualification for this evening's agenda? Okay, seeing none, um, we'll move to oral communications. I think we're supposed to have that on here, right? Yeah. So this is a special meeting. <laughs> Normally we invite, um, so maybe we need to do that since it's posted. Since it's on the agenda, I would recommend okay. doing so. So usually with special meetings, um, the agenda is a little different and we don't have oral communications, but our agenda as posted does have oral communications. We will give you, um, everyone, anyone present, the opportunity to give your, uh, share your opinion with us on the one agendized item, but oral communications is for anything not on the agenda. So if you'd like to address the commission on anything that's under our purview but not agendized, please come up now. Okay, oral communications are complete. And we have just one single item on our agenda. It's a accessory dwelling unit ordinance amendment. And I'll invite a staff presentation now. Okay, good evening. Um, so I have a what I hope will be a brief <laughs> staff presentation, uh, basically going through the um, legislative changes that were made to the, um, the act in the government code for the state of California that sort of enables accessory dwelling units in local zoning codes. Um, there were a number of bills this year that passed <coughs> relative to this, so um, I'm gonna do my best to summarize what was in the bill and then point you all to where, um, how we've made changes in our local ordinance to be responsive to that legislation. So, oh, sorry, and let me just introduce myself. <laughs> my name's Sarah Noisy, um, I'm in the advanced, I'm a senior planner with the advanced planning section here um, at the city. So just a little bit of background. Um, the city of Santa Cruz has been an advocate of ADUs for um, quite a while. We've had an ordinance since 1983. We actually led the state. The, the state had their first um, legislation in 85, 86. Um, we have amended this code a number of times in recent memory. Um, in 2003, we produced and published some prototype plans and guidance documentation. Um, that has since unfortunately fallen out of date, but that it's just sort of a piece of history for um, Santa Cruz that we are very committed to um, promoting ADUs as a housing source here. So ADUs are also an issue of statewide concern. The governor and the various members of the legislature are extremely concerned about how the housing crisis. Um, this year alone, there were over 100 bills related to housing and land use. This is just a sample of them. Um, illustrated very neatly here in a, um, an infographic, accessory dwelling units are up there at the top right. Um, and this was created in April, so this doesn't even include um, AB881, which is also very relevant to, AD, to ADUs. So housing is on the minds of the legislature. They have had their fingers in the ADU code for um, several of the more of the recent legislative sessions um, this year. Uh, whoops, this year three of these bills passed and I'll go through those in a moment. Um, but just to add another little piece of perspective why ADUs are an important part of a housing policy. Um, this is a graphic from the, um, that was created by MBEP, the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, about what types of policy changes could genuinely create an improvement in the affordability of housing in the Monterey Bay region. And as you can see there, I've highlighted ADUs are, um, Third, behind you know, subsidized affordable housing, which is obviously gonna have the greatest impact on creating affordable housing, and then rental housing that's built with an inclusionary component also would have a big effect. And then ADUs are coming in number three based on this analysis. So ADUs really are an opportunity for the city to create um, housing that rents at a lower price point than other types of housing. So, we are currently responding to um, legislation that was signed by the governor on October 9th. Um, for those that are keeping track, that was five weeks ago. Um, 
there were three bills that were the most relevant to the amendments we're going to discuss tonight, and that was AB 68, AB 881, and SB 13. And based on the way, so the way when, so each of these three bills amended um, the same section of the government code, section 65852.2. And um, so what happens when multiple bills are amending the same section of the code is that whichever bill um, gets signed by the governor last is the one that has sort of the final text in it. And typically what happens is that by the time they reach the governor's desks, the authors of the various bills have um, negotiated and the language is typically very similar across the bills by the time it reaches that point and they have what are called chaptering amendments so that you know, if two bills pass and one doesn't, you know, section one and section three of this bill go into effect and sections two and four don't go into effect. Um, and so that is the situation that we are working with here. The um, final text that I am responding to um, based on the chaptering is section 1.5 of AB 881. So um, if you go to read this legislation um, at home, Make sure you're looking at section 1.5. Section 1 has slightly different language in some circumstances. So that's just um, a point I'd like to make. Additionally, beyond the section of the government code specifically related to, a to um, ADUs, AB 68 does contain a section that um, about the standards for junior ADUs. So section 2 of AB 68 will become effective. And section 3 of SB 13 will become effective. And that um, SB that portion of SB 13 is about how the delay in building codes will be implemented through the health and safety code. So this pending legislation, there are essentially five categories of items that I'm gonna go through. There are amendments that relate to development standards, permitting, land use policy, reduction in fees, and delay of building code enforcement. Um, so items four and five on this list don't require amendments to our zoning code. I am providing them here as sort of informational items. They are part of the legislation and the city will be obligated to comply with those conditions, but we're not gonna discuss them in great detail tonight because they don't require us to change our code, our zoning ordinance. So I'm gonna start with number one, development standard amendments. Um, so the pending legislation states that ADUs attached to a single family home may lo no longer be subjected to a size limitation other than being 50% of the primary dwelling. So um, previously, they were also subject to a limitation on size of no more than 1,200 square feet. Um, in Santa Cruz, it's hard to imagine that there are ver very many ADUs that would be larger than 1,200 square feet if they're 50% of the home to which they're attached. So you know we don't have a ton of homes that are over 2,400 square feet. Other places, they have different standards, so um, in some places this 50%, changing this standard around 50% will actually allow for larger ADUs than was previously allowed. Um, and then also, the way the law is written, it states that local ordinances can maintain our existing site standards, but the site standards can't limit ADUs to being less than 800, 800 square feet in size which includes the above provision about being no more than 50% the size of the home. So what that means is you could have an 800 square foot, AD, uh, 800 square foot home build an 800 square foot attached ADU and that would have to be allowed the way that the state law is written. So in our ordinance to respond to those provisions, attached ADU size will now be 50% of the habitable area of the main home or 800 square feet, whichever is greater. The detached size of an ADU will be 10% of the lot size or 800 square feet, whichever is greater. That 10% of the lot size has been our, our existing standard for determining the size of an ADU. So essentially what this means is that for lots that are um, 8,000 square feet or smaller, they're gonna be able to build a larger ADU than they would have been able to build this year. Um, for lots that are larger than 8,000 square feet, um, there really is no change in the size of ADU that they're gonna be permitted to build. Um, we're also making a change to um, the size limitation for conversion ADUs, and this matches how we have been practicing and what our existing policy interpretation is. So a conversion ADU is an ADU that is using existing space. It's a garage, it's part of a house, it's part of an existing outbuilding, and we have allowed last year when we did 
the amendments, some of you will recall that we um, added the provision to do a little bit of an expansion to a, a, an um, accessory structure to allow for a conversion ADU. Um, and in practice, what we have been doing is that if someone has a conversion AD, a conversion a space to convert that, let's say, was you know larger than what their lot would typically allow, so they have a you know a 600 square foot garage on a 5,000 square foot parcel. We've actually been allowing them to convert the whole 600 square feet of that, and we haven't been holding them to that size limit. So we do think it's appropriate to have an upper limit. And um, the way I read the state law, that upper limit is 1,200 square feet. So this would be for you know existing structures that are converting a space. Um, we would allow that to go up to 1,200 square feet. And then lastly, um, we discussed, some of you may remember, we discussed last year changing our standard around rear yard lot coverage for ADUs. The current standard is that an AD, really no structure, but ADUs specifically um, can't cover more than 30% of a rear yard or required rear yard area. So that's the area that's contained in the setback um, that's required for the main house. And um, based on the change in the state law that says we can't have site standards that would prohibit the construction of an 800 square foot ADU, for all intents and purposes, that would essentially nullify this um, provision for lot coverage on you know 90% of lots. So we're just recommending that we delete that um, requirement for ADUs. The way the language is written in the proposed ordinance, ADUs would continue to count towards that 30% maximum for the purpose of constructing other structures. So, um, you know, if an ADU is built on a parcel and it covers 80% of that rear yard area, we wouldn't be allowing any more um, accessory structures to occupy that area. Um, but that this coverage standard wouldn't be used to limit the size of an ADU or the placement of that ADU on a parcel. Um, additionally, in the legislation, um, there is a statement that ADUs can't be limited in height to less than 16 feet. And um, as I read it, as we read it here, there was a deletion of a, um, the, the requirement to allow an ADU above a garage. So um, if you've read the correspondence, you saw that we've gotten some correspondence from Assemblymember Ting's office stating that they don't agree with that reading of the ordinance. Um, we corresponded, had corresponded with Assemblymember Bloom's office earlier in the month and gotten the opposite interpretation. So um, this is a place where we, you know, I, this is a place where we struggled a bit uh, um, as staff because the way that the law was amended at the state level, it was a little bit unclear what our, um, what our obligation was and what our purview was in terms of creating a, other standards for um, ADUs that are more than 16 feet tall. And so we had proposed one thing in the ordinance, and I'm going to talk about um, a revised proposal here in a moment because we've done some more thinking about it and, um, you know, and are trying to be somewhat responsive to the assembly member's letter that we received. Um, so I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And then the last thing that this, um, that the pending legislation did for development standards was it states that um, parking that's removed to create an ADU can't be required to be replaced. So an applicant could do that voluntarily, but we as the city can't require that it be replaced. So in our ordinance, to respond to those items, uh, the height limit for detached single-story ADUs has been raised to 16 feet. Our current limit was 15 feet, so that doesn't <laughs> seem like a, um, a very burdensome change. The setbacks will remain at three feet for a single-story, or are propo as proposed in the ordinance. Um, I'm going to come back to this height for detached two-story ADUs because that's the complicated part. Um, the height limit for attached ADUs, uh, currently the height limit for attached ADUs, it says that they have to meet the same, they're subject to the same standards as the um, primary home to which they're attached. So that standard would stay in place and we are recommending that we delete this, the um, standard that requires an additional setback for height that's over 15 feet. So in many of our zone districts, um, as height increases, the setback increases, especially in our multifamily zone districts. And this makes sense when you're contemplating, you know, a three-story multifamily structure that it would, you know, sort of step back away from the property lines. Um, when we're talking about an RL, you know, so a low-density multifamily site that's actually developed with a single-family home, this setback standard becomes a little burdensome when it's applied to just an ADU. 
So we're recommending that we delete that standard um, for all the zone districts in which it occurs. Uh, and then lastly, and then parking, we're just essentially reiterating what the state law says, that um, any parking that's removed to accommodate an ADU need not be replaced. So two-story ADUs, detached. Currently, um, our zoning ordinance, based on the laws that were in effect, lat are still in effect today and in effect until January 1, um, has standards for two-story ADUs when they face an alley, they can be 22 feet tall, and um, they can have setbacks of, do they have to meet the 10-foot setback when they face an alley? Uh, I'll have to look it up. <laughs> I don't have a committed memory. Anyway, um, so we have one standard for ADUs when they face an alley and a different standard when they don't face an alley. And then based on the way the state law was written this year, we had yet a third standard for ADUs that were built above a garage. So the state law as it is today states that when an ADU is built above a garage, a local jurisdiction can't require more setback from the side and rear property lines than five feet and five feet side and rear. Um, and that we have to allow an ADU to be built above a garage. Previous to that being in there, when, when uh, a two-story ADU was proposed on an interior lot, we were requiring a 10-foot setback from the rear property line and a five-foot setback from the side property line. The five-foot setback on the side is the same as is typical for most single-family dwellings in most single-family zone districts. Um, the 10-foot from the rear was a reduction by half over what the typical setback for the, so the setback in an R15 is 20 feet, and so we reduced it to 10 feet. For, um, for an ADU, the height for an ADU was also reduced relative to what was allowed for a single family home. So a single family home could be up to 30 feet tall and a two story ADU could only be 22 feet tall. So what we had proposed in the ordinance, um, which I still think is not a bad idea, but it, we're changing our recommendation. What we had proposed in the ordinance was that um, two story ADUs unless they were facing an alley, would have to meet the same setbacks and would get to meet the same height limitations, essentially, as the primary structure on the property, either the single family home or now, uh, under the state law changes, a, a multifamily structure. Um, in response to sort of the, um, the legislative intent that underpins Assemblymember Ting's letter, essentially that you know, we want to be accommodating and facilitating to all types of ADUs. Um, we are now recommending that we make a change to the way we handle two-story ADUs and say that when they face an alley, they may be 22, foot, 22 feet tall with five feet side and rear setbacks. When they're on an interior lot, they may be 16 feet tall with four foot side and rear setbacks, which is what is required by the state law. Um, and according to someone in our building department, you could conceivably fit a two story structure in 16 feet. No one has ever seen it. Um, so, you know, but this would, we believe, I mean, maybe someone would wanna do that. There could be a lot that's on a hillside where this, you know, kind of setup makes sense and, you know, is the right way to go. Um, but then we are going to we are recommending that we that we also have a standard for ADUs that are over 16 feet tall that they do require an additional setback, and we're recommending the standards of five feet on the side and 10 feet on the rear, which is essentially what we have today for a two-story ADU. So, um, just one clarification. Sorry to interrupt. I thought I heard you say on the first point 22 and five. The slide says 22 and four. Is that? Did you misspeak or was so, that the um, amendment? So this was, so facing an alley, we're saying 22 and four. Okay. And um, not facing an alley, we're saying 22, five on the side and 10 on the okay. rear. Thanks. Well, slide's accurate, okay. The slide is accurate, yeah. I don't have, unfortunately, I did not have time to draft like replacement code language for you, but um, I, I, if, <coughs> if you include this in your recommendation, this is part, now part of our staff recommendation, so if you include that in your recommendation to the council, I'll have the language drafted by the time we go to council. Thanks. So um, that's our long, uh, dramatic story about two-story ADUs and the height and setback limits that we are now proposing. 
so I, and I'll just comment here. I mean, one of the reasons that we want to be, um, that we're inclined to be a little bit, uh, require more setback with a two-story structure. Um, so so where, from where I sit in advanced planning, I rarely get phone calls about building projects, construction projects, building permits, like they rarely end up on my desk. Um, the calls I have gotten this year have been about two-story ADUs above garages where they're five feet from a rear property line. Um, it's really close. It feels really intimate. And um, we think this is sort of protective of privacy and a little bit of the, you know, the nature and character of Santa Cruz to provide a little bit more breathing room on those structures while still being really accommodating to single story ADUs. You know, removing that rear yard lot coverage standard is no longer gonna push someone to a second story um, where it probably has done that in the past. So that's our thinking there. Okay, so moving on to permitting amendments. Um, the pending legislation clarifies yet again, only ministerial permit processes may be used. This has been the standard for uh, um, two legislative cycles now and they keep reiterating it, so there must be jurisdictions that aren't following along. Um, but so ministerial permit processes for issuing permits for ADUs and junior ADUs, and I'm gonna discuss junior ADUs under um, land use policy changes later. And then um, ministerial permits must be approved for any of the following. So regardless of whether they conform, conform with any of our more sort of discretionary site standards, um, when there's a single family home on a property, we have to approve an attached ADU uh, a conversion ADU, which also now in the state law includes any space that is demolished and reconstructed in the same footprint. And those of you who have been on the commission for more than a year will remember that that um, standard originated here in Santa Cruz. We adopted that last year to allow for the reconstruction um, of an existing structure. And then also for the minor expansion of an existing structure. We had set that limit at 120 feet locally. The state law went to 150 feet. So we'll change our standard too. But so those are just, um, an example of how Santa Cruz is influencing state law. Um, we also have to allow a junior ADU, which I'll get to in a moment, and then um, we also have to allow a new construction detached ADU of up to 800 square feet in size. So um, these changes resulted in a number of amendments to um, sections of our code about permitting that we haven't previously had to amend relative to ADUs. So we added a, an explicit statement regarding ministerial processes and um, the 60 day review timeline that's also included in the um, state law. And I am also adding, um, we're going to, we're recommending that we make a minor amendment to um, section, two sections here, section 2408.810 is the section about um, slope modification regulations. and. Um, we're just gonna, we're recommending to change the language. So currently the sentence reads, in the case of construction of an accessory dwelling unit pursuant to section 2416-100, this section shall only apply when alternative site configurations are available to an applicant that would permit the construction of a detached accessory dwelling unit, scratch, delete, or scratch at least and add up to 800 square feet in size without the need for a slope modification permit. And then we're adding, and then we're proposing to also add similar language. So changing, adding that up to 800 square feet, also to section 2416.130.3 a little i, um, applications that propose to locate an accessory dwelling unit um, up to 800 square feet on a parcel or portion of a parcel triggering additional administrative. And then um, similarly down below, there's another reference to 800 square foot and we're just, we're adding the phrase up to 800 square feet in front of that. Um, additionally, under the same section 2416.130, which is about permit procedures for ADUs, um, we, have a, we have a statement in there um, about applications that are on historic properties that they have to substantially comply with the, um, guidelines for the Secretary of Interior um, for development on, on historic properties. And we're going to be adding a similar statement about substantial compliance with the citywide creeks and wetlands plan. Um, these two clauses are, we're adding because of this change about ministerial approval for an 800 square foot detached ADU that we can't 
apply any administrative or discretionary processes. So that's slope modification permits, historic alteration permits, and wetland um, watercourse development permits. So um, we're just adding language in here that the projects have to be in substantial compliance with those or they have to like modify their site plan to come into substantial compliance with those documents. Um, and we think this will give us the ability to enforce the important parts of those regulations and standards and while still maintaining a ministerial process. Is everyone with me? <laughs> okay. So um, then, as I mentioned, expansion of conversion ADUs. So previously, the expansions were limited to 120 square feet, now 150 square feet as per the state law. Um, and then for attached ADUs, I mentioned the additional setback required for height over 15 feet. We're recommending that that be deleted for all of the um, zone districts where it applies. Okay. More on permitting amendments. So in addition to those things that we just discussed that must be permitted with a single family dwelling, we also are now obligated to um, approve ministerial permits with, a, with existing multifamily structures. So this is a new change, allowing ADUs on a parcel with um, a multifamily structure and in fact within a multifamily structure. And you might be asking yourself, what is an ADU even when it's inside an existing multifamily structure? The answer is we don't know yet. We'll see what happens, right? It's, it's, it's an extra bonus unit that doesn't count towards density. And there are some limits on how many can be added to a parcel, up to two detached new construction ADUs, and at least, at least one and up to 25% of the total existing units created by converting um, areas in the existing structure. So, um, this would allow a duplex to add a, one converted ADU and up to two detached ADUs on the same parcel where there's currently a duplex. It would allow a, you know, a 40 unit apartment complex to convert up to 10 units inside the structure um, and add an additional two detached units on the, on the parcel. So, um, in order to address those, we've changed um, the zone districts where ADUs are now allowed. We've actually just given up on trying to list them because they are just allowed everywhere that we allow residential uses. And um, we allow residential uses in most of our commercial zone districts as mixed use projects. And so now those projects are also eligible for ADUs. So we're now just say that um, ADUs are allowed where other residential uses are allowed in conjunction with a residential use. Um, and then, again, we reiterate the um, conversion ADUs and two detached ADUs on, par on parcels with um, existing multifamily structures. Okay, land use policy amendments. So, as I mentioned, allowing ADUs on multifamily and mixed use property. This is going to be a change. I, you know, we're, we'll see how many of these we get that come in. Um, and I, I think there are going to be, this is a place where we may... Um, as, we, as we move into next year and start seeing some applications, we may roll into our um, you know, more proactive ADU process next year, some more site standards around ADUs, multifamily ADUs, and, and how those are, um, we allow those to be created. Um, for now, we're just implementing the state law. You know, we have a tight deadline to meet, and we don't have time to do all of the good thinking that we typically like to do when we make policy changes like this. Um, we simply don't have the luxury of that right now. Um, we also, uh, the state legislation creates junior ADUs uh, and requires jurisdictions to create junior ADUs. So junior ADUs were, are a creature created under state law a few years back um, as an option. Locally, we kept thinking, we can do better than that and we're going to do something better than that and we never had time to do anything better than that, so now we'll do what the state is requiring us to do. Um, the good news is they have made some changes to um, the, the junior ADU le legislation that were um, sort of some of the reasons we were hesitating to just adopt the state law. So um, it no longer has to be an existing bedroom. It can be um, an addition to a home. It can be, um, it, it can exist essentially on a spectrum from a fully independent attached studio apartment, no more than 500 square feet in size at the more complicated end down to, you know, its original intent, which was a bedroom, an existing bedroom in a home that has an exterior entrance and has a little kitchenette. May or may not have its own bathroom, 
but um, it could provide an additional rentable space and a little bit of independence in a situation where you actually have grandma living with you or you have roommates, so it could provide a little bit more privacy. So um, standards for junior ADUs can be no more than 500 square feet, has to be attached to a single family home, um, contains at least an efficiency kitchen which has counter space cabinets and appliances and it no longer limits those appliances um, to you know, 110 electrical. It may have its own sanitation facilities or share with the main home. And the irony here is that for junior ADUs, this is again one of these things that happens with the chaptering and having multiple amendments. Junior ADUs, um, we have to require owner occupancy right now. The way the state law is written, we don't have any um, leeway on that. And you may notice that the final bullet point here on my slide is that we are prohibited from requiring owner occupancy for ADUs for the next five years. So um, there may be situations where this is a little bit awkward for folks. Um, so you know, this is the, the how things happen uh, when state laws all amend the same sections of code. And um, you know, well, I have had a few conversations with um, Assemblymember Ting's office, who wrote AB 68, which contains these junior ADU um, standards. And they've mentioned that they're going to be trying for a cleanup ordinance this next legislative session. So hopefully some of these standards will be coming more into alignment. I'm not sure exactly what that will look like, but it's on their radar. They're, they're thinking about it. And then finally, so we're um, junior ADUs now, we have to allow them. Junior ADUs can be on the same parcel with an ADU. So now a single family home could have a detached ADU and an, and an attached junior ADU. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, we can no longer require owner occupancy for ADUs um, that are permitted between the 1st of 2020 and the 1st of 2025. So locally, um, we've added junior ADUs to our code, um, up to 500 square feet, attached or internal to this um, single family home, include a minimum kitchenette, and then, as I mentioned, there are a spectrum of options that would qualify for that. Um, as that kind of a creature of junior, a junior ADU. Um, one junior ADU and one ADU per parcel with a single family dwelling, and then um, owner occupancy for permits issued between 1120 and 1120 um, No owner occupancy will be required. That provision is not retroactive, so existing ADU owners are still bound by their um, current land use agreements. Um, that is one of those topics that I think we're going to be taking up when we do some more proactive work on ADUs this next year. Um, it's something that the City Council has kind of given us some direction to pursue and the way the legislation was looking early in the session, it looked like they were going to take owner occupancy off the table as an option. So we didn't sort of, we didn't engage that process with the community at the time, but it seems Given this discrepancy that's now been created between new ADU owners and existing ADU owners, that topic seems really ripe for community conversation. So um, it'll be on our list in the springtime. Um, so other, other things that are addressed in the pending legislation, these don't require amendments to our code. Um, they're uh, SB 13 and as a result, AB 881. Um, reduced fees, so ADUs that are smaller than 750 square feet can't be charged any impact fees, so those are fees for schools, parks, and our water department. A, a portion of that um, development fee from the water department is an impact fee, and we're working with them to kind of pull their existing fee structure apart a little bit so that we can comply with this. And then ADUs over 750 square feet have to be charged impact fees in proportion to the fees try charged on the primary dwelling determined based on a ratio of square footage. So um, again, water and, water and sewer are the ones where that's going to be the most complicated and we're working with those departments to um, figure out how to structure those fees. And then now um, new construction attached ADUs are now eligible for the same um, exclusion from utility connection fees that has previously only been available to conversion ADUs. So last year when we went through this, we talked about how if you're converting an ADU, you don't have to pay for a water connection or a sewer connection. Um, <coughs> that allowance or exclusion from utility fees has now been extended also to new construction attached ADUs. And then finally, the bills also contain um, language that would allow an applicant to request the delay of enforcement of a building code provision 
um, for a period of up to five years. And so between, for the next 10 years, they can request a delay of up to five years to bring their unit into compliance under certain circumstances. So, <laughs> you're all so riveted. Okay, so our next steps here are, um, we have our city council hearing is scheduled for December 10th. Um, th this ordinance contains language that states um, that if, if we don't have a compliant ordinance in effect on January 1st, our ordinance is null and void, and we're trying to avoid that. So hence the rush and the special meeting to make sure we could get your recommendation to the city council at their final meeting of the year so they can have the ch at least the opportunity to adopt an urgency ordinance that would put something into effect. So we're going to that hearing on December 10th. Um, and then after we get through this process, um, after the first of the year, we will be doing community outreach to cover the changes that have take, taken place and bring everyone up to speed who's been interested in following ADUs and interested in building one in the next few years um, to talk about what their options are now. Um, and then we are also anticipating that there will be um, some circumstances that with the haste with which we were required to write this ordinance were not contemplated. So, um, you know, maybe there are places where you have, where we have multiple single family dwellings on one parcel. You know, what are the standards that apply to that for ADUs? You know, we, there are some specific circumstances that we're gonna need to take some time and work through and discuss with the community. Also, um, as part of that process, um, I, I, it will be time for us to have this conversation about requiring owner occupancy and perhaps um, considering re creating some relief of that requirement for existing ADU owners. Um, your commission recommended that last year. The city council did not approve that at the time to relieve um, existing owners of owner occupancy, but did give staff direction to go forward and discuss it with the community. As I mentioned, based on what was happening with the legislation, we didn't engage with that process this year. The change that has happened had cre has created this gross inequity between the two groups of ADU owners, so we are gonna start that conversation with the community. Um, and of course, you know, the legislature's back in session on January 7th, so we'll see what else they have for us next year. Um, and then there are relevant portions of this ordinance that will have to be submitted to the Coastal Commission for um, their review before they go fully into effect in the coastal zone. So, all of that. Our recommendation is that uh, your commission recommend approval to the city council of the proposed amendments to the municipal code regulating accessory dwelling units. And we are available for any questions. Thank you. Are there questions of staff before we invite the public for comments? Mm. Mr. Singleton? So going back to the, um, the two-story ADU of 16 feet that has never been approved in the city code. So the only difference is essentially if you can somehow finesse a 16-foot two-story ADU on the property, you get a four-foot setback from the rear end property line versus if you were to go above that, you would have a 10-foot setback as recommended. Yes. Okay. Just clarifying. Commissioner Schifrin? Just a couple of uh, quick ones. With your staff recommendation, I assume the recommendation includes uh, approval of the ordinance as with the proposed amendments that you've specified this evening. Yes. The other thing I just wanted to mention, and part of, doesn't have to do with the ordinance per se, but in your introduction, you used, you showed a chart on showing various levels of affordability for different types of housing. Um, I vaguely remember, and you can remind me, whether as part of the general plan report, um, the last survey that the city did showed that uh, ADUs are no longer affordable units, that they're, uh, they actually end up being the same price as market rate units. So I just wonder whether that chart is really accurate based on the last information that uh, the city obtained. Sure, yeah, no, thanks for that, bringing that up. So um, so a couple of points. So number one, um, our last housing element report did sort of draw the conclusion, conclusion that we couldn't really say that ADUs were renting at less than market rate. Um, that statement is based on what we were able to find for in terms of ADUs that were listed on the market in a given you know period of time as we were drafting that report. 
Um, we recently, this summer, we conducted a survey of ADU owners um, and asked them how much rent they are charging their existing tenants. So these are not units that are on the market. Um, and we haven't done, you know, we haven't completed the full analysis of that. My impression is that they are cheaper market rate units. Um, I, it, typically they tend to be smaller than, you know, a, a other homes. So that by virtue of being smaller, they are creating a little bit more economy for folks that are living in, the, in those units. Um, we will be analyzing that data to really answer for certain if they are cheaper or not than other market rate units. My impression thus far is that they are a little bit cheaper. Um, and also, I think that part of the analysis that was done by MBEP in creating this um, is about creating um, supply of housing units. And so changing the number of units that are on the market and available for folks so they're not overhoused, um, so that they're finding housing that's the right size for their needs and that I think is a component of creating affordability. So I think that's part of the analysis that this group did when they created this graph. Will we be getting the report once you're done with the analysis? Of the survey? Yeah. Sure, yeah, I, my plan was to include that when I come back, you know, in the springtime when we're doing more sort of um, discretionary maybe policy changes to the ADUs, yeah. Thank I had you. hoped to have it done by now, but they're just um, time crunch. We'll also have it available in advance of our housing element annual report, which is due to the state on April 1st. Will that be coming to the commission? That typically does not come to the commission except upon referral after the fact. We don't get housing element presentations? This is just the annual update that shows the numbers of units that are produced. So we did uh, present that um, this earlier this year. It was after it's presented to council. Um, time permitting, we can bring it to the commission in advance, but oftentimes with the, the number crunching that's involved with it, um, we end up bringing it straight to the council and then uh, sending it to the planning commission on referral. FYI. Yes. Okay. Anything else? Well, if possible, I'd hope I understand the number crunching delays, but if possible, it'd be good to see it before it goes to the council. Completely understand. Mr. Spellman? Thank you. Yeah, I just have some questions basically related to the staff report and the proposed amendments. Um, the first one was about the two-story ADUs. I think your presentation kind of clarified the direction for that. Um, one question, you, when creating junior ADUs, um, you're, you're saying that it also will allow several properties that are currently subject to code enforcement mm -hmm. action mm -hmm. to apply for permits to legalize. Mm -hmm. Do we have a sense for how many units are in that pipeline? We, we don't, and that's something we're actually in the process of doing right now. We have a, a, a few hundred um, that are uh, in this legalization program, and um, one of our staff members is going through and, and looking at, um, you know, what the deficiency is relative to the zoning code, and and we're trying to get our arms around, you know, what, uh, you know, how many units can benefit from this code. My sense is it's on the order of dozens. Dozens. Okay. And then a clarification on when a submitted or per, you, you, you refer to language being permitted. So a permitted ADU will not have the owner occupancy requirement. Is that an occupancy permit? Is it's, that a, a, it's a permit issuance. So that means you hold your permit. So anyone, so. Hold your building permit. Hold your building permit, right. So we have some folks that have approved permits right now and they're waiting until after the first to pull them, which is, you know, their prerogative to do that. Right, okay. That clarifies that, thanks. Then in the category of other changes, the reduction in fees relating to 75 or 750 square foot and smaller ADUs, mm -hmm. um, there are, will be no impact fees. Right. Can you tell us approximately how much those fees are? Let's or see. Or say for a 750 square foot ADU, what would they roughly be? So, okay, so that's 
Parks is a square foot fee, right? Or is it a flat fee? Square foot. So, so yeah, okay. I'm gonna do some, we're gonna do some math all together here. So schools are in the neighborhood of three to 350 a square foot. Um, parks are in the neighborhood of four or $5 a square foot. Um, and then water is a little bit more complicated. Like I said, they typically, they have had up until now a development fee for a water connection for an ADU and it's already, their fee study has already contemplated that different types of housing have different water usage amounts and therefore different fees. Um, so rough estimate, my, I'm gonna guess that that is a savings of between $2,500 and $7,000, depending on exactly how big the ADU is and um, you know what, uh, I mean, I guess everything in the city is in one school district, so that that's all the same fee. So yeah, that's my that's my guess. Okay. And the the water fee, if it was applicable, I believe the water fee in and of itself is was seven thousand. Yeah, seven so, or eight thousand dollars. But a portion of that would still apply because it's not a portion of it is not an impact fee. So um, it's a little bit it's a little bit complicated to answer that question. But a, a substantial savings when you consider that as a proportion of the overall cost of construction. Right, right, okay. Then the third point in that same list, uh, new construction attached ADUs now have the exclusion from utility connection fees. Right. I'm just curious about, so basically the only one that is impacted by those fees are detached ADUs. Yes. I'm wondering why we wouldn't potentially want to include those in that same category. I mean, especially if you can show that you're connecting to existing utilities. Um, that's certainly a policy, you know, that could be pursued. I would want to, um, I would want the water department to weigh in on that because it, I, I mean, there, there's already sort of some, um, angst from that department about how they're going to be covering their costs. You know, this, Exempting units from fees is great for development, and yes, we need housing. We want to do that, and we also want to make sure that we are, um, you know, providing a good level of service for all of our folks. So, I, yeah, I mean, potentially, yes, you'd you'd want to hear from the water department about what those fees do and how their fee structure might be adjusted. Yeah, just from experience, I know many ADUs that go in they use existing infrastructure. There's no upgrade to infrastructure sure. other than paying that fee for, for no work essentially in many circumstances. Um, Commissioner Spellman, um, Commissioner Schiffer, I wanted to chime in, is that sure? Well, yeah. yeah, from <laughs> my time on the Water Commission, I think the, you know, as a water service provider under, maybe it's Prop 218, but the ch water uh, department has to charge users for the amount they use. They can't subsidize users. So I think that's a complication if you're adding more users, because there have been attempts to exempt uh, ADUs in the past from these fees, and it ran into this problem of um, the, requirement, the legal requirement that the fees be related to use um, in Prop 218. So I think that may be a complication that needs to be worked out with of course, on the other hand, if the state law says right. you have to do it, then you have to do it. But to the extent that the state law doesn't say that, it may be difficult to justify it under the proposition. So Sarah, you've gone deep on this. Did the legislature, did you hear any discussion of how to reconcile those things? Or? Well, I mean, I think that, um, I think the, I think these things come from, um, you know, different moments in time, different legislators, you know, different sets of priorities. Um, you know, we, at, at a certain point, you know, exempting, promoting a type of housing, exempting it from all fees is going to sort of nullify the validity of any existing fee study that, that counted on getting fees for all types of housing development. So at a certain point, not just Santa Cruz, but all jurisdictions are going to be in a place of, you know, potentially having to completely redo a fee study. Um, and then the you know, the question becomes, are we transferring the obligation for those, um, that money to other users? 
right? Are we going to have to increase our fees for multifamily housing because we're not charging them on ADUs and we are expecting now an increased number of them? So, I mean, this is this is a valid policy question. It's a complicated issue. Um, you know, I, I think that's um, you know something you could provide some comment on. I don't know that it's. I mean, it's not part of our ordinance. That's really you know fees are sort of handled separately and by a different department. Lee, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I, I think um, if it is of interest to the commission that a recommendation that um, it be evaluated and considered, and I know that the water department is, um, and even before the new slate of bills uh, took effect, the water department is looking at their system development charges and is planning to have those updated by um, the middle of next year. And so this would fall in line with that. I don't know specifically what they're doing with ADUs, um, but I know that they're, they're looking at revamping their entire uh, uh, fee structure as it relates to system development charges. And um, you could make the recommendation that it be looked into as part of that process. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my perspective on this was merely from one of, it sounds like we're penalizing detached ADUs. Everybody else is getting a pass on it except for the detached ADU. That's, I mean, there's obviously reasons why those fees are in place, but that just seems to be the way this is written or, or could be read. Yeah, it's certainly encouraging a specific style of development. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then the, the second point, this delay of building code enforcement, I'm not sure I understand clearly what that allows <coughs> somebody to do? Where, is there an example of where or how this would apply? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I can, I, can, um, I can tell you what it says here. So um, in the government code, they are adding a section to say, um, in enforcing building standards, et cetera, et cetera, of the health and safety code for an ADU described below, a local agency upon request of an owner for a delay in enforcement shall delay enforcement of a building standard subject to compliance with um, this new code section added to the health and safety code. So the circumstances in which um, an owner could request the delay of enforcement are that the ADU was built before January 1, 2020, so any existing ADU, or the ADU was built after January 1, 2020 in a jurisdiction that at the time did, had a non-compliant ADU ordinance. So essentially um, the effect of this is that um, ex ADUs that exist, this is, I think the intention here is to assist ADUs in legalizing. So existing ADUs that exist, that are you know, built without benefit of permits, um, I think would be most typically the ones that would request this delay of enforcement. And then um, to the health and safety code, um, SB 13 added um, some responsibilities of the, of the building department. So with every, um, every time there's an enforcement action taken against a unit like this that qualifies, part of the notice that we provide them has to inform them that they are entitled to um, a delay of up to five years of any provision. Um, and then they have, um, let's see here, what does this say? Um, and then they have up to five years to bring their unit into conformance with the standard that was trying to be enforced. So it essentially allows some space for ADUs that are legalizing to kind of spread their costs out. That's how I'm reading this and understanding it. Um, so we're working with our you know, building department about how they're gonna you know, adjust their process and their practice about um, handling these cases. This is really relevant for ADUs that are in our legalization program. Um, I mean, I think in some ways this could really be a benefit. It could allow them to, you know, spread their costs out over a period of five years, and that might be a, a lot more manageable for some folks. So, so if I understand you, you're referring to, let's say there's a, a unit that's not considered a legal ADU today, Mm -hmm. you would recognize it, it has to be recognized somehow as an ADU, and then they could request essentially the five-year break on building code enforcement. Yes, that's how I'm reading this. 
Yeah, so it correct, if correcting the violation is not necessary to protect health and safety. Okay. Yeah. And that's the key. So if there's something like you know, they aren't meeting the insulation requirements, um, if, even of the time in which it was constructed, um, then you know that is going to create some additional energy usage over the next five years, but it's not a life safety issue. Um, that would allow for the person to legalize something that maybe is a life safety issue, um, but it, wait to spend the money towards the things that are less critical. Okay, thank you. A few more in here. On the floor, the, where am I? So development standards, sorry. <clears throat> Why do we have a greater square footage on conversion accessory dwelling units? Um, essentially, so um, this, this has been a policy interpretation that we as staff have been implementing. So when a structure already exists to be converted, um, we're not mitigating any sort of, you know, community or neighborhood effect of like bulk or, um, you know, lot coverage, water infiltration by limiting the size of that space to, um, you know, the size that we would allow for new construction. You know, we have limits on new construction to kind of, you know, have some say over our urban design and the way that our, you know, the fabric of our community kind of develops. In the case of an existing structure, um, we just didn't see the logic in, implement, in implementing a limit on size. That said, um, it does seem that having no limit on the size of a conversion is also not really reasonable. I mean, there are some, you know, there are horse barns out there that, you know, are 30,000 square feet potentially. Maybe there's two in the city limits. But um, so we've just, we're suggesting that we have codify now this practice of allowing conversion ADUs to go up to 1,200 square feet. Thank you. And on the large home design permit standards that have been revised, mm -hmm. if I understand that correctly, the only ADU that would be included in the square footage calculation is for an attached ADU when there is additional work, other additions being proposed to that residence. Read that correctly. Can you point me to a section? Oh, sorry. It's um, number 13, I think. That's Large a piece home design of permit. It. I see. Uh, okay. That's a piece of it on page 8, but it comes up again. There's more <coughs> on page 11. At the top. <coughs> so a conversion ADU is not included, a detached ADU is not included and attached ADUs that are essentially submitted as a project in and of themselves right, without are not substantial work to the home are also not included, which only leaves attached ADUs with other work happening to the house, essentially. It just, that doesn't seem. Yes, no, that's a good catch. I think um, what this should say, so, the, the portion of the state law that we are being responsive to with these um, standards is uh, that we, we can delay action on an ADU permit that's submitted in conjunction with a permit action on the, on the home or on the other main structure on the site. And we also are not allowed to have any, we're not allowed to apply any standards but ministerial standards to the ADU portion of the project. We can delay action on the ADU permit until we've completed our action on the main structure, but we have to um, only use ministerial processes on the ADU. So I actually think this needs to be amended. Thank you. Um, I think this needs to say, um, I'm not sure what this needs to say, but I this needs to be to amended. I think no ADUs, right, count, because the only one that is counting is the, is the Attached. Yeah, I think work. I think I think it's worth making clear here that um, a, a large home design permit could be triggered in a <clears throat> context of an ADU project, um, but not by the ADU. So um, let's make that part of our recommendation that Does we correct know what this. Our current code. 
says about that's included in what's not this is this, this is, is the current code number six okay. is the current that's code. the current yeah, number six code. Is in, so, is in the current code yeah. yeah so we'll need to update that and i think i think sarah's correct that the first portion of this it will need to update to say that um, it, that we're not counting the square footage um, towards the trigger of whether a large home design permit is required so right now the way it's it's worded that would count for attached if there's an addition to the house yeah, no, and, that's, and so we can way. so yeah. so sarah correct me if i'm wrong but uh, it, i think we need to have that say that um, whether there is an addition to the house or not the only portion that counts towards a large home design permit is the addition to the house itself and not any addition to the adu yeah did that's what it needs to say. Not the new ADU uh, square footage. Not yeah, the new not ADU the square, footage square footage. So we need to um, we need to amend that section. Yes. Thank you. And the, on uh, substandard lots on page ten. <clears throat> yep. So I can see this playing out. So what happens if? the rules that are in place for substandard lots prohibit the 800 square foot ADU. So let's see, the following design standards shall apply but shall not serve to limit accessory dwelling unit to a size of less than 800 square feet. So that's- We would not apply those standards. So you could- We have to allow coverage. coverage. Yeah. Yeah. In theory, right. those coverages could be exceeded up right. to the 800 square foot. Up to 800 amount. square feet. I mean, and this is worth, you know, so this is worth having in here also because, you know, some substandard lots, they may be eligible based on size for a 1,000 square foot ADU. Um, you know, the state law doesn't obligate us to approve every application that comes to us. Um, every application of 800 square feet and smaller, yes, we are obligated to approve. So that's why um, we're referencing that size. Okay. And then, um, Section B of the same substandard lots, does the ADU area count in those calculations? Yes, and shall not serve to limit the unit to less than 800 square feet. Page 12, number six, this talks about parking permits now for ADUs, and we're gonna limit the number of permits to only the number that the house would have been allowed to have, essentially. I'm just curious on the thought process there. Well, so that's, you know, that's part of our existing code. So it's not underlined, so that's existing code language. Okay. Um, and I think that comes from policy in the, parking program already to not provide additional permits to, to um, properties with ADUs. Okay, so I guess it highlights a, a potential conflict moving forward if we're gonna allow two ADUs on a parcel sure. in addition to a home and, right. and yes. potentially eliminate parking. So, and parking, and so, yeah, and so ADUs are already um, locally not, re no ADU is required to provide any parking um, and the addition this year locally is that um, we also now cannot require any parking to be replaced that's removed in order to accommodate an ADU. Um, so, you know, the, both the legislature and, and, and frankly, you know, the city also, I think, has um, made a, a conscious choice to prioritize housing for people over storage for cars. And um, there are moments and neighborhoods where that is gonna be less comfortable than other moments in other neighborhoods. And that's, you know, that's just true. Okay, on that point, I would say that um, under the next section two, covered parking, same page, right? Now we're restricting plumbing fixtures and, and the potential to convert spaces for parking by specifically saying you can't have those things essentially in fear that people would do it and not permit it, I'm guessing. Uh, I'm sorry, you're looking at... So the current code, right, 
My point would be, don't we want to allow these spaces to easily be converted in the future as opposed to not be easily converted if we don't allow for the potential for future plumbing or things like that? Um, so yes, we do want to allow spaces to be converted. Our code is focused on ensuring that that happens with permits. Um, so I think that's where that language is really coming from. It's just making sure that when, where that where conversions happen, it's done with a building permit. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not saying it's not, but I think we're going out of our way to say you can't do a lot of things, which which would make it more difficult to convert later, especially if you're on a slab foundation. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you can do it with. I mean, you you just you need a ZA permit and a land use agreement that says it's not a unit until you get a permit to make it a unit. So, I mean, we don't prohibit it outright, but you're right, I mean, we do make it more complicated for folks. I think that's, that's all I had, thanks. Commissioner Greenberg and then Commissioner Nielsen. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering about a couple of things. One is um, the discussion in the document um, on ADU ordinance amendments um, that gave a little background on the deed restrictions um, associated with affordability, um, where and this is on page seven. Um, when the city council reviewed the last round of ADU amendments, and this is associated with the owner occupation okay. um, waiving of that, when the city council reviewed the last round of ADU amendments in January and February of this year, staff was directed to conduct a community outreach process to discuss the option of removing owner occupancy requirements from ADUs in exchange for a deed restriction that would limit the rent collected on one of the two units on a property, thereby creating a housing unit for a moderate or low income qualified renter to pay an affordable rent. But because this new legislation no longer requires the owner occupancy, that's not um, an, at issue. And I was wondering first what the the process was behind the staff being, <coughs> um, you know, directed to um, move in that. Pursue area. that? Yeah. Sure, yeah. So last year, um, last year around the same time I was here before the Planning Commission and we were going through a set of amendments to the ADU code that were a combination of updates that were required by the state law at the time, in addition to a number of proposals that had come um, out of the housing blueprint process, which had been conducted earlier in 2017, and, um, and out of community outreach specifically around ADUs. And so there was a whole suite of amendments that we brought forward to the commission and then to the council. And one of those was um, lifting the owner occupancy requirement. Um, this is something that existing owners of ADUs are some, I mean, not all, but you know, they are the strongest voices in the room to remove the owner occupancy requirement are folks that own ADUs already and are limited by that standard. Um, we, we do have a program for um, ADUs that are legalizing, and it, so for ADUs that are currently exist without permits and would ab be able to get permits for everything except for the fact that it's not an owner-occupied property, we have had in place for a few years a program that would allow that unit to get legalized to get a building permit and would allow the owner to continue to live elsewhere and rent both units on the condition that one of those units was rented to an income qualified household at an affordable rent. It allowed them to accept section eight vouchers, which are essentially a market rate rent. So this was a really good deal. And we were only providing this deal to people who were had built without permits or violated an existing land use agreement. So um, rightly, people who are playing by the rules said, we want that same deal that you're giving people who didn't play by the rules. So that was sort of the beginning of it. And then at the beginning of the year this year, it looked like we were gonna lose that standard entirely. And we thought, you know, why engage in what is bound to be a pretty contentious process one way or the other, come up with a set of standards and then just have them, you know, sort of yanked out of our hands by the state saying you can't apply any owner occupancy 
requirement. It just seemed like a lot of wasted effort. So we didn't engage with that this year. Um, they had, you know, whether or not it's still, it would make sense to apply affordability to those existing homeowners now, if we, you know, went forward to like recommend that we remove owner occupancy in exchange for affordability on existing ADUs, you know, I think it's a little bit of a different conversation now, given the direction that the state has gone with these ADU regulations and removing owner occupancy for new units. You know, it's sort of um, folks that are coming in to legalize now, they just kind of get everything. They don't have to live on the property. They can, you know, completely legalize it and they'll never have to have a land use agreement that requires owner occupancy. Um, it's, I, I think some existing property owners are probably rightly upset about that. Um, so, you know, that's the, so kind of some of the background. This is, you know, at the time, a year ago, it seemed like this might be a way to create some affordability, you know, and open up the, like, create some potential for more ADUs to be created by allowing a little bit of investor development in, on condition of affordability. Um, so it was something we were going to engage with in the community, and, um, you know, we'll take it up again this year. So, um, and I'm just thinking about the earlier question about how affordable existing ADUs are, and we'll see the results of the survey and so forth, but I don't know if this is an ongoing conversation given this shift, both about like what it might do to existing affordability now that this change is in place um, for both existing ADUs and, you know, and the, the non-compliant one, previously non-compliant ones. Um, but also potential other incentives. And I know that in the other, um, in the document uh, ordinance, you have, um, you know, fee waivers, for instance, and other types of incentives. And I don't know if, that, if this is an ongoing conversation. About, you know, um, ways to en encourage affordability, incentivize affordability. Yeah. yeah, and there, you know, there is, um, I think there's a lot of content there, potentially. Um, I, I do think, you know, it's, it is challenging also, you know, um, the, the issue with ADUs, one of the issues relative to affordability <laughs> is that um, there's really no economy of scale. You know, you're building one unit, you know, so your construction costs are just what they are, you know, a 300 plus dollars a square foot. You know, I don't know exactly what they are today. I know they keep going up. Um, and, you know, there's no real way to economize in, in terms of, you know, building more than one unit at a time. I mean, potentially there is that a little bit now with these junior ADUs and with a lower level of amenities, those might be providing some lower cost housing. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of meat there, yes. There's also um, a, a state bill, one of the bills that passed this year, um, requires jurisdictions to come up with ideas for creating affordability in their housing elements. Mm -hmm. So um, luckily for Santa Cruz, um, our region is after the San Francisco Bay region, so we'll get to um, cheat off them. their homework. Yeah. Yes, learn from them, that's what we should say. Um, and about you know what those what those tools might be, you know, short of a loan program, which you know a loan yeah. program really could yeah. facilitate that and so where would that funding come from and what are the options HCD is also supposed to be compiling a list for us of funding sources mm -hmm. potentially for ADU development so mm -hmm. I'm optimistic that there might be some options out there um, I don't have them right now I, it's a challenge you know we want these to be affordable and I think some of them genuinely are mm -hmm. um, yeah. but not all of them and not always and it's, there are a lot of factors right for sure yeah um, and uh, along those lines, yeah, I, was, I had a question about loan programs, and it would be interesting to research that, but also um, when you previously had the model ADU designs, mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that some of the costs, um, and I know it's important for architects to have jobs <laughs> designing ADUs, but at the same time, it can be good to have existing templates um, for folks, and I don't know if you're thinking of updating or employing some you sure. know, local architects to update uh, those designs. <laughs> so that was something, you know, sort of the guidance documentation of all kinds, like, you know, stock plans and like how to do a garage conversion guidance and, yeah. you know, what if, how to finance a construction project. That was, um, that is stuff that we would like to get into and engage with. Um, you know, it's a matter of like, I hate to say this all the time, but like staff capacity. Yes. Um, yeah. And also, I will say, you know, the stock plans, it, 
29, the stock plans are in a really different place in 2019, 2020 than they were in 2003, 2004. Yeah. So I, you know, and prefab construction is also in a really different place mm -hmm. than things were at that time. Um, you know, we had some challenges with maintaining our own stock plans that, um, you know, I, I think there probably are ways to address those. We did, you know, they just, they didn't develop as many units as we had hoped. Mm -hmm. um, they were great for publicity. They got a lot of people thinking about what an ADU might be like on their property. And then there were a lot of people who said, I want this, but I want the mirror version because my site is oriented, you know, this way instead of that way. Or I want this, but let's add another bathroom. And then you just, you kind of, you just lose all that, yeah. you know, economy that you had there. So that said, yeah. Santa Rosa, who is rebuilding like crazy, mm -hmm. um, has pursued that model of having some pre-approved plans. And so I'll be interested to see what their experience has been with that. Because our experience, you know, 15 years ago was that, you know, great marketing tool, but like mm -hmm. not that many units actually got created. So mm -hmm. I just, you know, who knows exactly why that was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mr. Nielsen. Uh, first, <clears throat> I'd like to thank you for going through all this and in such a short amount of time that you've, you, you haven't been given a lot of time to get through it all. And I appreciate you really digging into it and doing it. So thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I have a question about multifamily. Um, so for the conversion, um, 25%, um, I, I think I understand that. But what I don't quite know is how the decimal is going to be handled. Oh, good question. Do you have a recommendation? <clears throat> well, you gave an example of a duplex. So we have to allow at least one. Okay, so it's at least one conversion yes. for the property. Yes. You have one conversion and then two detached. detached. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think... What, I mean, and what, what other standards do we have? The way we, where we deal with de decimals? Is it, are we at half, do we go up? Or, I mean, ha, it, is there another example um, in our ordinance? Let's see, hang on. Let me look what it says. Let's read the text exactly out of the state law. Let's figure out what our um, obligation and leeway might be. Up to 25% of the existing. So up to 25% suggests that we could round down Oh. Yeah, that's yes. Yeah, that, that's what it would shall allow what it up like. to twenty five percent. Okay, so that, that there's the answer, I guess. So I, if your commission feels that we should move, the, you know, these are minimum standards, and we can be more generous as, you know, we mm -hmm. prefer locally. So you know, if you think we should round up at point five. Well, I mean, I think I mean if if yeah. I think so, but I mean, I, I'm open to hearing um, other people's uh, or other commissioners' um, points of view on that. Um, but it sounds like what I didn't understand is that in the in the law it says at least one, but up yes, to 25. Yes, it says okay. yes. Yeah, shall allow at least one ADU within an existing multifamily dwelling, and shall allow up to 25 percent of the existing multifamily dwelling units. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so then the other. Um, questions I had and and may and it might go back to what you how you started out your uh, presentation in talking about all the bills um, <clears throat> that have been passed but in terms of the ones that the one that you're really dealing with is 881 yes that's so, the one that has the final text so okay and, that, and maybe that makes sense because I was reviewing some stuff from AB 68 that seemed to be in conflict with what was proposed in in this in these amendments. So, is that is that probably why that that is the case? Yeah, I mean, there's this whole process um, when multiple bills amend the same section of text, um, and so I don't. Um, it's not my intention to be dramatic, but it took three days of phone calls to Sacramento to figure mm -hmm. out which section was the final text that we okay. needed to be working from. Right. <laughs> um, and or maybe I do want to be a little bit dramatic. It was it was dramatic <laughs> at the time. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So so with with each of those bills, you have to you have to read all the way to the end. And usually, like sections, you know, five and six are say like 
know, section one and two of this bill will become effective if AB 68 and AB 13 pass and 881 doesn't. And it's like all of this stuff about yeah. which passes first and which one goes this. And so then you look and see which one was chaptered last based on the number. They get assigned a number as they're chaptered. Um, it's like they produce this delightful little scavenger hunt for us um, in so, this process. So. I, guess, I, guess the, I guess one question I have about that is um, the correspondence we did receive was relating to AB 68. Right. Right, so is that is, is that why you guys feel like, I mean, you, you made the modification, but um, but, you, but the, in the, your original intention was to not follow that, and was that because it's not in 881? Well, so the letter that they sent, honestly, I read it through it again, and I, <laughs> um, I don't know how they intend us to read that two-story ADUs continue to be required. They've deleted the only reference to two-story ADUs in the law. Mm -hmm. um, so, additionally, um, you know, we this is this is a letter from one legislator. There are three bills that passed, mm -hmm. and I have not. You know, we don't know what we would hear from all of the other. <coughs> Legislators, and then the entire legislature passed these bills. Um, I have not been able to find, doesn't mean it's not there, but I have not been able to find anything in writing about the legislative intent that's explicit about two-story ADUs. Um, so I know this is an interpretation that we're saying, you know, four-foot four setbacks on a 22-foot tall structure is um, inadequate. Uh, undesirable, squishy, um, and based on my reading, I feel like it's a reasonable interpretation of it. That said, I'm not interested in like you know going through a bunch of like Sturm und Drang to create a local standard that then next year the state comes back and says, oh, and also remember ADUs above garages, you always have to allow those four foot setbacks. Mm -hmm. So you know. We struggled with this. You know, this is a piece where they, they aren't explicit. They don't give us a lot of guidance. And I have an email from com, from Assemblymember Bloom's office saying, yes, that means you can dis, you can exclude two-story ADUs if that's your choice. Right. So it, we're not getting consistent messaging from the state. And I think this is one of the challenges that they are under, too. You know, they we don't have a lot of time to digest this. You know, they similarly work all year, I think, kind of at this pace where they're, like, making amendments and changing language and going to subcommittee meetings and changing this and then combining with the other bill and deciding when are they going to consolidate into one bill and when are they going to maintain them as separate and hope that they get chaptered in a certain way. You know, I don't, it's complicated. I don't have a simple answer. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, I, I appreciate you going through it all um, and trying to make sense of it all. Um, I do have, um, some questions in the I'm refer I'm in the um, in your amend amendments strikeout underline um, document. Okay. Um, this is on page eight, and um, there's a at the at the bottom of the page. There's sections fourteen, fifteen, and then and then to the next page. There's sixteen lined out. Yeah. But those sections, like some of those sections are still, like, for example, 16 is green building standards, right. that's lined yes. out. But above it as number 12, it's still there. Yes, those were inadvertently duplicated mm. last year. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, I'm, th that's just a straight up okay. correction. Got it. <laughs> um, okay, but, but it, since, and since we're here, I do have a question just going back to, and, and I guess, you could tell me that I shouldn't be referring at all to, to AB 68, and that's fine, I can, I can. A lot of the language is the same, so let's okay. dig so in. Okay, so one of the things that I see in here, it says, um, it, it, there's some wording here that says, no other local ordinance policy or regulation shall be uh, the basis for the not denial of a building permit or a use permit under this subdivision. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering, are green building standards, that's an ordinance, and is that um, we because we are requiring a certain um, level of 
we have a difference between conversion and um, and new. Yes. Um, so is that is that a are we are we in an area where we shouldn't be with this? So um, so first of all, that language is in AB 881, and in fact, in the section that is the final text, it reads. No other local ordinance policy or regulation shall be the basis for the delay or denial of a building permit or use permit application under the subdivision. Um, and the green building program is um, part of our completeness review. So in the same way that buildings have to apply, comply with the building code, when, and we will not accept an application or deem it complete until they comply with the building code, that is the same for the green building standards. So, um, yes, I think we're okay keeping that. And also, you may remember that last year, your commission recommended that we delete that language that holds ADUs to a different standard than single family dwellings. Mm -hmm. The council rejected that at the time and encouraged us to, or encouraged, directed us, they don't encourage, they directed us to um, look at ways that we could connect relieving folks of that requirement with affordability. When we go back to the council this year, we intend to take them an analysis about that, that removing this standard is unlikely to generate any affordability and therefore we should just go ahead and delete it. We're gonna be recommending that again to the council um, with new analysis. And also, should they, not, should they choose not to go there and they wanna keep that standard, I think we're okay. I think, that's, I think that would be allowed under this state law. Okay. I I, I think I understand what you're saying. It's not, it's not that the permits are denied based on not meeting those requirements. They're just, I mean, they're. The standards are extra. You know, some. It's just an incomplete application yes, at that point. Yes, it's an incomplete right? application. You know, and some applications, it's not hard for them to meet. In other applications, it starts to get challenging. Um, but those are delays that are on the applicant's um, time. Yeah, they are you right. know, pre before the application is complete. Right. Um, so then another question that I have, and I don't, I don't <coughs> yeah, I guess it does, I mean, again, this comes from 68, but yeah. um, uh, it says this bill would delete the provision authorizing the imposition of standards on lot coverage and would prohibit in an ordinance from imposing requirements on minimum lot size. So uh, in, uh, on page 10 in, in the same document, um, going to uh, section five about substandard lots. Um, there is, there's um, this, uh, there's text in here about lot coverage. Right. Um, so how does that, um, how is that in compliance with this state law? So, The way they write these bills at the state, um, I was talking to one of the legislative aides about you know what it says in the law and what she thought it should say. And she's like, we just tell legislative council what we want it to say and then they write it. So um, I think sometimes there's, there are things that get lost in translation because what they, the change that they made um, to uh, eliminate using lot coverage as a standard they changed, they changed this sentence. It says, um, this is subsection B, a, a subsection, section 65852.2, so government code, um, ADUs, little a, one, big B, um, what ordinances shall do, um, impose standards on an accessory dwelling, on accessory dwelling units that include, but are not limited to, parking, height, setback, deleted lot coverage, landscape, architectural review, maximum size of a unit, and standards that prevent adverse impacts to real property listed in the California Register of Historic Resources. So it says including but not limited to. So deleting something from that list is really ineffective. Um, mm -hmm. Also, later in the, in the law under um, a section, little c, one, big C, about um, setting minimum and maximum sizes, so this is what um, we shall not do. 
is um, establish by ordinance any other minimum or maximum size for an accessory dwelling unit based upon a percentage of the proposed or existing primary dwelling unit or limits on lot coverage, floor area ratio, open space, minimum lot size for either attached or detached dwelling units that does not per permit at least an 800 square foot accessory dwelling unit. So um, did they delete lot coverage as a standard? Because I see it in multiple places. So um, we are complying with this section that says we can't use those standards to prohibit someone from building an 800 square foot unit. Um, and we, keep, we have those standards in our code, and, um, and I believe under this, as long as we allow an 800 square foot unit to exceed them, we have met our obligation. Right. Okay, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Yes, that's fine. Um, I, think, I think that was it for me. Thank you very much. Vice Chair Spillman, had, you had one, more? one more question. On the 60 day rule for approval, uh -huh. Could you clarify for us some of that language, just for everyone's benefit? Is that 60 calendar days? And what does it mean for a project to be deemed uh, complete to start that clock? Eric, do you want to answer that? And, a one for, and then what would happen <laughs> in the case that the day, 60 days expire? <coughs> Uh, so, so I can answer that. So in, in terms of um, our review timelines, once we have a complete, Eric can answer what a complete application is. Um, when we, once we have um, a complete application, we are essentially ready to issue the permit. So the way that we structure our process is that we accept applications that we know we can approve. So um, we are not concerned about meeting that 60 day timeline. Our timelines are typically less than that. Um, and we hold all of these standards. If they're not complying with a standard, it's not a complete application. It's not one that we can, you know, it's not gonna make it far through the process and we reject those over the counter before we take them in. So um, in terms of what a complete application is, I'll let Eric. Know. Well, when, when a building permit application comes in, it gets routed to various departments and every department is reviewing it for consistency with their applicable codes that they administer and, um, and then they comment back on those. and. Um, it's at the point when all of the departments have accepted um, their review as being complete or approved is when that clock starts ticking. Right. Uh, so, pardon me. It's not done over the counter. The completeness review is done through, through routing to all the agencies. That's, yeah, my mistake. So not much of an incentive to what currently happens, essentially, if I'm understanding that right. The change from 120 yeah, to 60? Change. I mean, yeah, we are, we're already, you know, faster than that if you, you know, if you consider what a complete application is. Well, I should have asked this earlier, but for the benefit of everybody, um, since we're going to go to public comment, um, can you just um, help people understand what you mean when you say ministerial permit? Of course. Thank you for that question. So um, a ministerial permit is a permit that's reviewed um, based on objective standards and criteria um, and reviewed at a staff level, does not require any application of discretion by staff or public hearing body and does not require a public hearing or notice. Thanks. And then my question was, do you don't have any, um, the compliance with the Creeks and Wetlands Plan doesn't, you don't have any uh, concern that that's you can still call that honoring a ministerial permit grant granting that um, so you know the I think the language that we choose there we, we want to choose that language carefully so similar to the language we chose for the Secretary of the Interior standards it's substantial compliance that keeps us out of um, requiring CEQA on an on an ADU so um, we think we can do that. We think we, we, you know, we review things for substantial compliance with, you know, with the general plan and, and other parts of the zoning code. So I think, um, honestly, I think this is the best we can get because we can't require a watercourse development permit for an 800 square foot ADU. Yeah. Um, I hope we can. I, not, I mean, I hope, I hope it, we can get this. Yeah. Right, the, the intent, <clears throat> is to uh, still be able to achieve those important protections, repairing protections or historic preservation protections, um, and still 
operate under the legislative mandate to issue a ministerial permit. And so we will be reviewing for the standards that are spelled out in the streams and wetlands documents, as well as the Secretary of the Interior <coughs> standards. And that review will occur as part of the ministerial process. You don't feel like we're out on a limb there. That's safe, right? I Well, we have coordinated with our attorneys and um, we think that um, the state code gives us the flexibility to apply standards. It explicitly calls out the historic preservation criteria, which is why that was in the initial draft. And with the other criteria, as Sarah was mentioning, it identifies that we have the ability to provide a wide range of standards. And in, in the case of streams and wetlands, you know, the setbacks from that document would be a part of those standards that we would be reviewing the application for conformance with. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions before we go to public comment? So this is a public hearing. We'll invite um, members of the public to um, come and address the commission. We'll open the public comment now. And if you don't, uh, we can't require you to offer your name, but we invite you to do that and um, ask you to and could sign in and then come to the lectern. Everyone can be given two minutes. The lights will go to um, yellow to let you know you're about out of time and then red and you'll hear a beep when, it's, when your time is up. Please help me as the facilitator of the meeting to finish your sentence and wrap your, up your comments um, when that happens. And um, that's all. Thank you, yes. welcome. Hi, I have a question about setbacks. Um, I know now that um, an existing building like a garage uh, can be on the property line. And uh, if you add to that building, uh, can you go along that same property line to add? Uh, do you have to come in four feet when you add to that building? One thing I one thing I should have clarified also is that it's it's a little ungratifying because it's not a dialogue. You, we just um, oh, invite okay. you to offer your comments and then all right, and then we'll try to address them when we close public comment. All right, uh, just another suggestion about. Um, uh, affordable housing. If you really wanted affordable housing, um, you would allow people to live in detached bedrooms. You know, you could have a, a, a small little building meeting building codes but not having any utilities per se that where they use the house that w and it would be way more inexpensive to, uh, to do that and, uh, and allow more bedrooms and more people to live because the, the code enforcement loves to tell you that it's a detached bedroom, you're not allowed to sleep in it. And I don't see what is inherently degrading or scary about sleeping in a deta detached bedroom. That's my comment. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Eric Schneider. Um, thank you all for your work, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really happy to see the state's guidelines to create more housing in Santa Cruz. Uh, I'm a landlord, I've been a tenant, and I, um, I want to, I guess I want to say a couple of things. I want to say something about the uh, rental inspection um, department. I had, I recently had a non-permitted uh, dwelling shut down by the rental inspection unit, and I believe that Santa Cruz is losing a huge amount of housing both known and unknown by, um, by the rental inspection program under the auspices or under the, uh, the pretext of health and safety. And I think that given the uh, desire to create more housing, um, it is, uh, it's sad um, because a lot of people are, are affected, both landlords and I have landlord friends who uh, are elderly, who are sick, who depend on that, and we, and I'm no longer scared because I was caught, but we are scared, and it's, it's really unfortunate. This five-year delay will give some, some kind of sense, but to kind of actively go after, and there's a very aggressive program 
that the planning department has with the rental inspection to actively go after uh, people for non-permitted dwellings in this climate, I think, is a really stupid policy. Um, I also want to just address briefly the, um, I think that to do anything to limit the housing, uh, encouraging low-income housing in ways, but to, to uh, put land restrictions, do whatever you can to make intelligent, safe housing. And that's what the state's requiring you to do. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Hi, good evening. My name is John Wizard. I work here locally, and, and one of the things I do is monitor local ordinances. Um, so very quickly, because there's only two minutes. Um, so ADUs are, are naturally affordable, naturally occurring affordable housing because they're physically smaller, but uh, in an economic model, the market still bears the highest rents. So your point's well taken. Um, for, for your comments, um, just as a for instance, if I own a home and um, my parents live somewhere else and one of them has a stroke and I leave to go take care of them, I can't now rent out my ADU because I don't live in my home, but it's not because I'm choosing to, it just happened. So there's, I generally am not a big fan of owner occupancy requirements because it, it harms people who have the best of intentions. Uh, to your question, um, so the inclusionary housing ordinances and uh, state density bonus law all say round up when you have a decimal. So those are state law, those are local ordinances, they all say round up, whether it's 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 0 0.9, round up. So there is a legal basis for you to, to ask such a question. Um, um, so I was really excited to hear that, that Assemblymember Ting's office sent that. Um, I looked at the law and I thought, wow, that's, um, or the, the proposed ordinance, and I thought, well, that's really interesting. And then I thought, well, Assemb Assemblymember Ting authored AB 68, so I, that's interesting that he tracked that and, and followed up with you guys. So I, I appreciate that kind of give and take, and i generally not excited that, like, Assemblymember Bloom is talking about somebody else's law as though he knows the intent of what Assemblymember Ting did, but that's a whole different thing. Um, so I just, I, I'm appreciative of the, the compromise because I know that Santa Cruz has been a leader in ADUs and when I saw that 20 foot setback, I thought that seems a little bit onerous because we're talking about land, it's not binary. It's, they're, they're uneven things and they're things that are naturally occurring. So I'm just really grateful that you guys are willing to, to have that conversation. Excuse me, so thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Are there any, any other speakers after? Um, welcome. Yeah, um, about that welcome. Uh, I have no idea why, um, given the time spent with uh, uh, questioning and all and the number of people in the room, why you would limit comment to two minutes. Absolutely no idea why you would do that. Um, my name is Mark Primack. I uh, was actually one of the uh, architects uh, contributing the design to that original manual. Um, I, there were six paid. I was on the city council. Um, I couldn't uh, I get paid to do that work, but none of the architects uh, would lower themselves to design a garage conversion, so I volunteered such a design. Um, a single mom uh, uh, built that uh, uh, Garage conversion, uh, she acted as a general contractor, soup to nuts, everything, city fees, $38,000. That was in 2005. 10 years later, I, I watched another woman stand up before the city council, explain that she and her husband had just gotten their permit, pulled their permit for an ADU in their backyard. They hadn't put a shovel in the ground and they'd already spent $50,000. I think when we talk about affordability, the buck stops here. It's city departments, it's uh, city policy that ruins the affordability of ADUs. Um, I think I can uh, shed some light on the five-year clauses in the state bills. I've been tracking these bills and it's generally three steps forward, one step back. Uh, the bills this, in this round basically spoke of uh, doing away entirely with the owner occupancy requirement, retrospect, uh, retroactively, uh, that it would know all of that. And, um, and so the compromise was five years for the new stuff and within five years, um, uh, probably even within the next year, that the owner occupant, occupant requirement will go away. And, that, and I say good riddance and it'll save the city a lot of hassle and it'll bring a lot of people forward to uh, create ADUs. The same is true of the 
Well, I could tell you, I could explain the five year uh, 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 um, delay on uh, enforcing uh, codes, but uh, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I think this will be the final speaker, unless anyone else. Welcome. Okay. Uh, my ears just perked up a little bit when um, you know we were talking about the 60-day uh, requirement for approving um, a uh, uh, an application, and uh, but prior to that approval, there is a process for um, uh, uh, verifying the completeness of that application. I was just wondering if there are any sort of standards or or policies around how long that review process takes, and if not, um, I'm curious how long typically that review process does take and whether or not it would be warranted to develop some standards to so that people have an understanding of uh, how, uh, you know, so there could be some expediency in, in working to get a, an application completed. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments for the commission? So we'll close the uh, public comment. I can respond to the previous question if the commission would like. Welcome. Yeah, um, please do. Sure. The the policy is um, from submittal to the first round of comments is a three week turnaround, um, and then when the uh, the applications resubmitted or the designs resubmitted, it's it's down to two weeks, um, and it can oftentimes be less than that if it's just very minor um, type of corrections that need to be made. But that's the policy. That policy comes from state law, right? Completeness review is a 30-day letter. No, that's our internal policy for oh, building okay. permits. I see. Yeah. Okay. And if it pleases the commission, there were two other questions that I think um, I tracked at least that we could respond yeah, please to. please do. Um, there was a question about um, or a comment about not being able to leave and help out a sick parent. Um, and we do have... Um, uh, provision whereby the, I believe it's a council approval, correct? It requires for, council approval. Yeah, it requires council approval, but it, it is set up for scenarios just like that, and I believe it's up to two years. Yeah, it's one year, and then and administratively, um, the planning director can extend for another year. So so there are options for, for special situations like that, so I just wanted to, to put that out there. And then there was another question about existing buildings, like a garage on a, par on a property line. And adding on to that, um, Sarah, I'm going to put you on the spot. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so currently the code allows garages to be built at a zero setback. You could build a new garage at a zero setback, and there are many existing garages that are built. Um, sometimes, surprise, they're over the property line, um, which is you know always fun when we find that. But So they can be built at a zero setback. New construction that is not going to be a garage does have to meet the setbacks that are required today in the zoning code. So um, for um, accessory structures, those are five feet. For um, single story ADUs, they're three feet for, for sure. Three feet for a single story ADU. And for yeah. accessory structures, do you know? There is no setbacks for just for non-habitable accessory. Oh, for non-habitable. Okay, right. So it, like a garage, you could continue that at the zero setback. I'm, I'm sorry. We, we, we I'll try to cut off the public comment at the end of that. Sorry. We're available for questions. I mean, I can I can be available after tonight's meeting, and then um, I'm, my phone number is on the website. I'm happy to answer any questions about ADUs. Okay. And then were you? Did you want to address any of the other questions from public comment? The detached bedroom. Maybe clarifying for. So at this point, um, we do not allow detached bedrooms. Right, yes. Um, there are instances where um, they can be used for pool houses and uh, things of that sort, but they're not for um, awesome. sleeping purposes. Um, that is uh, something that um, we've heard not only from the member of the community that stood up here tonight, but from other members of the community as well. Um, there are building code and uh, planning code um, challenges, I would say, um, 
not necessarily insurmountable, but certainly things that we would need to look at in terms of how we are, um, uh, in terms of modifying our local regulations and how we're applying statewide regulations of the building code in order to achieve modifications to the uh, current regulations. We we do have uh, guest houses allowed, um, but it's only in a agricultural residential suburban zone district, and there's very, very few properties in the city that have that. So I'll just add, though, um, you know, one of the things that is in, on the um, the longer term work plan for the um, ad, uh, advanced planning section is taking a look at our housing types. Um, and that comes out of the housing blueprint is to take a look at, you know, are we providing the right kinds of housing in Santa Cruz? Um, you know, we want to take a look specifically, we know we want to look at our SRO and SOU ordinances, but also more broadly than that, we want to be, you know, junior ADUs were initially going to be part of that project. Like, should we allow junior ADUs and should we allow junior ADUs maybe in multifamily property? Should we allow more than one in a single family home? You know, these and some of that might get rolled in with the you know work that we begin in the springtime of around ADUs and junior ADUs. Because um, I think there is definitely some hay to be made there with those ideas. But um, this concept of a detached bedroom would certainly be part of that bigger conversation around are we creating the right kind of housing for the needs of our community? Detached bedrooms might be an option. Lodging houses might be an option. Um, allowing a mix of unit types when you have an SRO or SOU so it's not just like a monoculture of those types of units. There's that's a conversation. It's on our long range work program. It hasn't been prioritized for the six months that we're in right now, um, but I have a feeling it will appear in some form on our two year work plan, which is gonna go to council at some point. When does it go to council? It'll be a three year work plan that goes to council and um, it'll be within the next six months. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Schifrin. Okay, I'll lead off. I thought you were leaning into your mic. <laughs> no, I wasn't, but I'm happy to start. Um, given the public comments, given most of the comments of the other commissioners, um, I, I have an alternative perspective, I think, on accessory dwelling units. Um, my approach or my feeling about them is more ambivalent. I think they are a potential source of housing I think the state law now um, has uh, changed the nature of what an accessory dwelling unit is. It's no longer an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, the condominium I live in is less than the maximum uh, size of an accessory dwelling unit. My concern is one of trying to strike a balance between providing more housing and essentially destroying the single family neighborhoods that exist in Santa Cruz. Um, through allowing uh, two, three, four uh, units on every single family home property. Not only is this going to create lots more people in the neighborhoods, which is going to change them, but my particular concern is losing the owner occupancy requirement is going to mean that families will no longer be able to afford housing because they'll be bought up by investors who will then be converting them to uh, as many units as they can squeeze on the property. Uh, I'm concerned about the elimination of parking and what that's going to do in terms of um, the livability of neighborhoods. Uh, my sister used to live in Jersey City in a neighborhood that had no off-street parking because all the houses were built before there were cars. And there were knockdown, drag out fights over parking. Cars were destroyed because somebody parked in somebody else's space in front of their house. We're moving towards creating uh, public, making public streets into private parking lots so that Washington Street now uh, is not available for public parking downtown at all. And I think as we lose <coughs> parking spaces, um, we're going to see more and more of that. So I think what's missing from state law that I see is not only the uh, attempt by the state to have a broad brush and control development in every community, no matter what its uh, characteristics, uh, taking away from local government the ability to determine the quality of life in its community uh, without uh, much of a sense of balance. 
So my sense is um, that's the law. I can su I will support the staff recommendations. I do have uh, two suggestions to make. Given my concern about parking, as I think about how parking is being reduced and eliminated, it seems to be based on the notion that people, uh, if they can't have a place to park their car, they're not going to have a car. And um, that's a uh, uh, questionable assumption. But I think um, as we want to encourage people to use other modes of transportation, we want to encourage uh, bike, bike bicycling and uh, bus passes, I'd like the commission to consider <coughs> recommend that we add some provisions that tenants in accessory dwelling units be provided bus passes and that accessory dwelling units provide uh, enclosed space for bicycles uh, because the um, to leave your bicycle outside is dangerous as I think those of us who do it know. Um, and I think it's possible to include within uh, a space within uh, an accessory dwelling unit that would allow people to, to um, park their bikes and would encourage bike parking. Um, I also, in another area, feel that um, it's important that the design guidelines that the city has adopted in various uh, um, neighborhoods in the community be adhered to as part of the, um, the accessory dwelling unit permits, as, and I think it's, uh, it's legal to do that as long as it doesn't, it wouldn't prevent a, a uni, uh, ADU of at least uh, 800 square feet. And I think, I, I think one of the things I like about the state law is it does have different provisions for uh, ADUs that are up to uh, 800 square feet and as opposed to those that are greater. And I think, as a couple of speakers have said, we, having smaller ADUs is going to have at least cheaper market rents because market rents are cheaper for smaller units. So I think encouraging uh, smaller units is consistent with state law. So um, as I said, I've, I've shared my um, transportation concerns with staff and my design uh, suggestions with staff. and. I was told that there wasn't this a disagreement that they were consistent with the law. Staff wasn't, wouldn't recommend them, but on, on the other hand, I think they're, they're, they're not contrary to what the law requires. So when it's time to make a motion, I'm going to request that uh, those changes be added to the ordinance as well. Could you repeat the last two changes, just? Well, um, under parking, which is number nine, uh, number two under development standards, uh, I would add language: all ADU tenants over the age of 18 shall be provided uh, free bus passes uh, as appropriate. And then a number two that would says ADU shall contain adequate enclosed space to store at least one bicycle per bedroom. And then under 14, or create a 14, which would say design, ADU shall conform to the design guidelines that may apply to the parcel proposed for development as long as such conformance does not make an ADU up to 800 square feet infeasible. And just for clarification, um, who provides the bus pass? Landlord. Okay, so landlord would be required to buy a bus pass for yes. the tenant? What, what did you say about bike parking? Can you repeat that? That, um, sh that ADU shall contain adequate enclosed space to store uh, at least one bicycle per bedroom. Now, of course, if somebody doesn't have a bike, they have more storage, which in smaller units is desirable as well. But I think allowing, um, I have the, the condominium project I live in, um, does not provide any internal space and actually doesn't provide any external space for bike parking. And in, uh, in my particular unit, uh, we ended up building a shed to hold the bikes because we didn't want to leave them outside in the rain in a little tiny patio that we had. 
So I think, you know, if we, if one of the goals here <coughs> is to encourage people not to be having cars, not to be using cars, then we should do more than say, you can't, we're not gonna require you to provide, we're not gonna require parking. We need to start taking actions um, to really provide the facilities and the infrastructure that's going to make the provision of, um, of um, uh, the, the provide an incentive for bicycle parking. We do that for multifamily, uh, for multifamily projects. I think there is a way to do it for single family buildings as well. Commissioner Singleton. All right, um, I've got a clarifying question really quick before I get into a bunch of stuff. Um, so for staff, uh, just in response to one of the public commenters, um, for garage on a property line, um, if you wanted to build an ADU on top of the garage, would you be required to terrace it back from the property line or would that be allowed to abut? Um, yeah, so that, that gets into our um, two-story standards that we're proposing. So um, um, today, the way the state law is written, we we allow a, an ADU to be built above a garage at a five foot setback from the side and rear. So yes, it does have to be stepped back. Um, what we're proposing here would allow an ADU to be built above a garage at five foot side setback and 10 foot rear setback. And so on the, the issue of the five versus side versus 10, um, the, the stated reasoning in the staff report and as you said out loud was that um, uh, you said that a four foot setback, which is um, for a 16 foot tall two story ADU, um, was insufficient for a 22 foot tall ADU. Um, and that uh, you increased the, the setback versus what some member Tang and his staff had sent um, to us to be 10 feet um, as a respect for privacy. Um, so I'm just curious, what is the benefit of privacy versus the rear lot line versus the side lot line? So I live in a really dense neighborhood sure. um, and I've got people on all sides of me. Many two stories look right into my backyard. Yeah. If someone in my, was in my backyard on the back line looking in the same, why is the 10 feet versus five feet for the rear line different than the side line privacy wise? Sure, yeah, so um, I think just typically side setbacks are smaller than rear setbacks. So the setbacks for a, a typical single family home in a single family home district are five feet on the side and 20 feet on the rear. Um, and it, it has to do with, you know, when, when two houses are facing the street, you know, no one's windows are looking out then onto your backyard, right? Like if all the houses are kind of built in the same envelopes in proximity, in, you know, relatively on their sites. Um, so I think, Folks just tend to be more sensitive about that rear property line. And yes, there are configurations of parcels in which it's less relevant, you know, where back, pro you know, rear property lines butt up against someone else's side property line and it's, a, you know, a little bit squishy and not everything is just one, you know, idealized planning interior parcel of 50 feet by 100 feet. Um, and Typically in planning, we see more sensitivity around the rear setback than around the side setback. So that's, I mean, this is just sort of building on our current practice and our, you know, historic, what's in our zoning code for other types of structures. Okay. So it, it's largely just because people feel better about it? I, yes, I mean, and I think also legitimately it does, based on how parcels are oriented, it does provide more space and, and setback. Um, for rear properties, for for backyards. Is there any way we could address that worry about privacy through design guidelines and placement of windows versus say like setbacks? I mean, you, possibly, yeah. I mean, it's also, you know, it's a matter of, this is a subjective thing, right? Like I'm not, um, this isn't the only way to, to do this. Like different communities have different design standards and they set things up in different ways. And um, you know, it's about local context, and this is what we feel like really reflects our local context. Because it's also, you know, it's about shade, it's about bulk, it's about the, you know, sense that your that your space in in the in a rear yard is is private, whether or not there's a you know a blank wall or a wall with windows. Um, the proximity, I think, does make an, a difference in how people feel about their property. So, like I said, it's subjective. You know, if your commission wants to make a different recommendation, um, that is absolutely your privilege. Okay. All right, um, those are my technical questions. I guess I'll just get kind of right into how I feel, which is 
you correctly diagnosed Commissioner Schiffrin very different from you in a lot of areas, which is fine. Um, I'm well, for one, I'm very thankful that the state is stepping in for a lot of these guidelines to make it a lot easier to build ADUs. Um, I see them as a much more approachable um, and easy, frankly, politically easier form of housing to get passed, especially if we're gonna switch to a, essentially providing a basic riot in almost every, every residential area to be able to build an 800 square foot ADU, however you can get it done. I mean, I think that's great. And the fact that it's a ministerial pr approval process through 60 days, I mean, I think that's, those are all steps in the right direction. Um, you know, the setbacks thing, uh, if it makes people feel better, I mean, I'm, it's, I, I, I'm much more inclined to support the stack of recommendation with the four foot setback for two store ADUs, but for the sake of just moving forward and moving us in the right direction, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with the 10, the 10 foot rear setback as a compromise. Um, in terms of just the impacts that ADUs have on neighborhoods, I mean, I've lived in a lot of ADUs. I've lived in an ADU that a public speaker uh, had here. Um, uh, I, you know, I've even lived in a council member's ADU before. Um, I think they are uh, they are definitely more affordable units than if you're gonna get a two bedroom apartment or something like that. Um, you know, but there, frankly, there isn't a lot of affordable housing left in Santa Cruz and you'd be really struggling to find a bedroom even just in a house for under $1,000 these days. So in terms of affordability, and if we have the permitting fees, which are gonna be tens of thousands of dollars, um, even with the waivers and because of the water hookups, and you know, we have some anecdotes about really expensive fees and things, and you know, in talking with people who have built ADUs recently, including that same council member, it turns out it was a lot more expensive than he really thought it was gonna be, over $100,000 in construction fees and everything. And that ROI, uh, is, is, is a long, long shot. Um, well, it just takes a while. Um, so, I mean, in terms of like how we are imagining our community of the future, I mean, Santa Cruz is gonna continue to grow. Um, our population growth rate has been remarkably consistent at between one and 2% a year. And it's largely grown with the same population trends of the state. So we have to reimagine our neighborhoods and our communities and the densities that we live with if we're gonna accommodate a diverse community. Um, so I'm less concerned about ADUs being in neighborhoods in terms of the overall density because I think every neighborhood's gonna be more denser in the future. That's just the nature of, of coastal California. We've decided to make concentrated steps of, of, of concerted steps of protecting our green belts and our environmental open spaces. The other end of that compromise is to densify the areas where we think it's appropriate. And I think ADUs are a great way to do that and they're practical and they're they're not to economies of scale, but at the same time, they allow individual homeowners to make very concrete, rational financial decisions in order to hopefully build, and given our awesome codes now, and hopefully some new state laws, a better incentive to get those things done. Um, I'm really not worried about the owner occupancy requirement in terms of facilitating a bunch of out of area investment. Um, I think, if, if anything, you'd find that more families who aren't able to own homes would be able to rent out homes where the owner could potentially not have to live in the ADU in the back now. I think that would actually free up a lot. Um, in terms of parking, um, again, uh, I think uh, our staff said it most eloquently, you know, we're really in the business here of trying to house people, not cars. Um, and I think things that we, anything we can do to help promote that um, is, is a step in the right direction. I think it's, it's interesting that we have all this talk about parking and the worry about parking and its impacts in the neighborhoods. And yet we have the same argument being uh, hashed out right now in our downtown about whether or not to build a parking garage mixed use library project because people are worried that we're gonna provide parking. Um, I mean, it's, we at the same time, we wanna promote bike parking and, and wanna encourage people out of the cars and I wanna have housing for out of cars, but it's interesting that I hear that this, a lot of folks saying that, you know, we're gonna need to have parking at some point, so it's just an interesting balance. Um, and just overall, I, I, I'm, I'm really happy that we're moving forward with these kinds of things. Um, I think this is, going to be the future of, of housing development in Santa Cruz because you know we only get a couple big projects a year, maybe on a good year, maybe when financing's good, maybe when we're not in a recession. And so if we really wanna actually increase the housing stock and, and do it in a way that makes sense and allows people to you know, better utilize their own property in ways that can help the whole community and the collective goals that we've outlined, I think that's great. Um, so those are just my comments. Um, and I would love to, to move the staff recommendation. A motion? That is a motion. Second. I'll second. Question about the motion. Well, I'd like to, uh, uh, I thought all the commissioners were gonna speak first, but if, we, if we're gonna act on, uh, I'd like the opportunity to, to propose some amendments, um, 
but bring a friendly amendment. I, I don't. Uh, I would be surprised if it was be accepted as a friendly amendment. But uh, that would be the process. Um, I'm perfectly willing to suggest it that okay. way. But I don't know whether how you want to run this discussion. Whether you want to let other commissioners weigh in on the issue first before we start acting on the on the motion because. There's a there's a motion and a second, so all discussion will be should be directed toward around discussion should be around the motion. Well, let me ask you how you're intending to proceed. Um, if you're wanting to move to a vote on the motion, then I'd like the opportunity to make some um, amendments. If you're intending to proceed by allowing other commissioners to speak to the motion first, then I'll withhold my amendments till the other commissioners have had, had oh, no. a chance to speak. The latter. Okay, then I'll, I'll wait to hear what okay. other commissioners right. have to say. I, who wants to go? Anyone? Commissioner Greenberg? Um, well, I, don't, I mean, um, in terms of uh, the density question, I would agree in many ways um, with Commissioner Singleton. Um, I think that, um, you know, a lot of the, the problem is the fact that we have so much single family home zoning uh, in the first place within an urban area. Um, and so to the degree that we can densify at the same time, I understand that there are trans, you know, with the parking changes transportation issues and um, I guess the question I have is the degree to which there's coordination going on between this housing change and transportation planning and for instance bus lines and frequency of buses and any effort on the part of the metro or others if for instance there's a significant mm -hmm. percentage increase in population in neighborhoods as a result of you know, single uh, ADUs being constructed. People are talking about there's going to be this like housing boom going on in cities around California. Is there a discussion at the state level or more locally around how that's being coordinated with public transit? Because ideally, we would have multifamily housing much more prevalent along corridors that would allow for transit. We're kind of retroactively, you know, infilling um, and densifying single family home districts and how does that coordinate with transit? So um, I'll take a stab at that and then I'm gonna invite Lee to add any thoughts that he has. So think while I'm talking. Um, so in general, one of the, um, unfortunately one of the disadvantages of ADUs is that they are very dispersed. So in terms of um, planning for a really efficient transportation network, they're not the ideal form of housing. Um, that said, locally, Metro Transit is constantly in the business of evaluating ridership information and evaluating whether new routes or different routes or more frequent service on a given route is, um, is required. So um, specifically relative to ADUs, I am not aware of any effort to combine transportation with um, uh, Land, the land use choices with the exception of um, there is a carve out in the state law that where ADUs are within half a mile of transit and now they finally after three years have put it in a definition of what a transit what transit means it's any bus stop um, no parking will be required and that's part of the state law so our local law last this last year already eliminated all parking for all ADUs so you know I didn't discuss that portion of the state law but it is in the state law in terms of um, you know making it easier for parcels that are in proximity to transit to build ADUs. So hopefully those will be the sites where they develop sooner. Um, and um, I think that, I had another side. oh, so there are other efforts about other types of housing that are really focused on locating um, intense housing development near where we have existing transit. So building on our existing high quality transit opportunities and you know, there are definitions of that. There was a, um, one of the laws that changed this year was about making a big, a pretty significant change to the state density bonus. So when um, projects that are 100% affordable are built within a half mile of high quality transit, they get an enormous bump in density. So, you know, that's a different type of housing, right? And that, you know, that makes sense in kind of a different way. Um, this is one of the challenges with ADUs is that they are dispersed. That allows them to fit into our very suburban context here. Right. So it's this balance of, um, you know, how do we accommodate our growth in this dispersed 
pattern, which, you know, let's be honest, like we seem to prefer that. It's what we manage to get done. Do. <laughs> so, well, you know, I mean, generally as a community, it's what we have built up over the past decades, you know, and Previous it's- Previous generations, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, you know, this, this is sort of, you know, one of the, one of the places where we are. So I think, you know, zip cars and jump bikes are a piece of addressing that transportation need with ADUs because they are just by nature more dispersed. Um, you know, and I think Metro Transit does their best to stay on top of things and reevaluate. Do you have anything to add? No. Okay. So that's just a conversation I think we'll have to have is to think more holistically about how, given our existing housing stock, um, I mean, I know that in Oregon, for instance, they're no longer allowing single-family home zoning. <coughs> so, um, and I think that new generations recognize and you know prefer access to transit um, to a great degree. Um, and so, earlier generations, I think it was very car-centric kind of a design of, of this area. Um, so, we're kind of making do given the existing kind of grid and, and stock. But that being said, this is a creative approach. And insofar as we can, as you know, in thinking holistically about planning, talk together, um, I think uh, that would be really ideal. Um, and I really like the idea of supporting biking, you know, to the degree possible and infrastructure for biking, whether that's within housing units or uh, perhaps in some, in some cities they have uh, bike sheds that are dispersed by block, you know, and there's spaces that can be provided for bikes um, that are protected, particularly obviously in downtown areas, but um, but elsewhere as well. So, in, or in housing complexes that are putting in, yeah. So I think that's a great idea. Um, the question of owner occupancy, I think, is an interesting one, and I, I agree that, you know, from what I've read, you know, after the foreclosure crisis in 2008, there was this huge influx of of families renting homes um, as opposed to apartments. And we see that a lot in this community. Um, and so the need for housing that can be rented out, which may have an ADU in the backyard, you know, makes sense. I don't know if you're aware of any research on the relationship of uh, owner occupancy and affordability, if they're, you know, and the trends that we're seeing, you know, the degree to which, and, and also the rationale on the part of the state for eliminating owner occupancy. Um, as a requirement, like what is the thinking there? And was that in concert with any discussion around affordability and the potential for speculative investment, for instance? Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I imagine that there, so this is this year is not the first year that this idea has been floated about owner occupancy. It was, um, I believe it was part of the agenda or, or part of some of the bills that didn't pass last year. And um, the, this, the concern about, you know, investor prospecting essentially and like, you know, buying up sort of that bottom tier of for sale housing that's typically like the first step in for first time home buyers. Um, I think that's a, that is a very real concern that's shared in a number of different communities. Um, and I think that the legislature is really focused and a lot, have a, they have a lot of policy right now that is really focused on volume. Um, and less so concerned about specific affordability levels in a lot of ways. So um, I know there are um, quite a number of communities, we looked into it last year, in California who don't require owner occupancy and have not required owner occupancy for, you know, one year, eight years, you know, 25 years, never. Um, and they have a variety of different experiences with that set of circumstances. The thing to remember about ADUs is that um, communities don't use them in the same ways. I, last year when I was working on the ADU recommendations, I was speaking with um, a planner who was in Sunnyvale and they were like, you know, we don't really build that many ADUs here. And I was like, how can you not build that any, many ADUs? Like it's like the most common inquiry we get at the counter. It's like the most, like we build so many here. I mean relatively, relative to our other application types. We take in so many applications yeah. for ADUs. You know, we probably produce between, you know, th around 40 to 50 a year. Yeah. We expect that to go up. And um, she said, I mean, in Sunnyvale, we build apartments. Right. So, I mean, it's part of this, like, what's your whole housing policy and your whole zoning code and your whole general plan and what are, you know, it, yeah. This is a piece, right? ADUs right. are a piece, and right now they are a politically easy piece to get through. Right. And so there is a lot of 
action on them and everyone's trying to make it like incrementally easier and incrementally cheaper and great. And also, you know, I think those, that increment of benefit is gonna reduce, reduce, reduce. And owner occupancy is a big shift. I mean, that's one place where you can make one change and make a deep, profound shift in what's available to be built. Um, you know, investors are more likely to have the capital to do a project like this. They're much, they're more likely to be interested in doing a project like this. Um, and so we are about to enter a period where we will see what the effect is. It's hard to say, you know, prices are starting to soften. So maybe this is going to hit at just the right time. And I don't know, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but, um, I don't know that it was specifically ever linked with affordability to get back to your specific question. Um, I think it's really focused on numbers, numbers production. Yeah. Supply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I support this. I mean, it's, a, it is a piece of m a much larger, I mean, mm -hmm. I like that graphic of all the solutions that need to be out there for affordability um, and the housing crisis. And this is a, a necessary piece, particularly in communities like ours. Um, we've been a leader in this area. Um, it's great that we could continue to be. Uh, I like the idea of others' creative strategies and that there's going to be a conversation on how to bring costs down up front for the construction of ADUs, potential funding, um, and loan programs uh, that might, in, you know, kind of make it easier to, to rent at lower rates, potential deed restriction mm. conversations as well that could be exchanged for that, um, but understanding that it's obviously one part of a much larger puzzle. So thank you. Vice Chair Spellman, I think you were next. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some good thoughts happening and some good dialogue. I would, I would argue that, you know, we're still being reactive in our discussion about our housing availability and adding housing to our community, um, even to the point where I think we should have had the discussions about owner occupancy already with the community. I think we put those in the back burner because we all thought it was coming and it was going to be approved. So now we're sitting here with a little kernel of a five year for new ones, but it's not addressing the issue, right? How many units could we get tomorrow if that, uh, without having to build anything, right, uh, on the market? Um, so I'm interested in finding a way that we can be more proactive. I don't know if this commission can can act as a, can we take a leadership position and propose to investigate these issues somewhat more thoroughly and be bringing concepts forward as opposed to just reacting? I think our, uh, our workload's been pretty light and it's until we have discussions like this that people understand the complexity of these issues and the give and take to you know, community building and adding housing but we're what, we're four years into a, a housing crisis and a housing emergency, and we're just making baby steps. And we're just reacting to what the state is telling us to do. Um, we've lost the, the gumption to be the leader in ADU development and you know, a model for other communities to, to look to. Um, we have that history. We, we should be in, in that seat once again and start uh, coming up with, you know, the realities of what our community needs. You know, we can't exist as a single family community, obviously. So we're going to have to come to terms with, you know, having a more dense uh, feel to our neighborhoods. Um, I think there's ways we can address some of those immediate issues. Uh, I'm glad that the height limit for two-story ADUs was not followed through as, as staff had proposed. I think those were, were too restrictive, but you know, if, if somebody's building to a four foot setback, you can't have any openings in it anyway, right? You can't have windows or, or doors in it. So you're gonna have to either move further away to do that. Five feet is the, is the minimum for a, for a window in a, in a wall on an exterior property line. So those are in play. Um, we don't see many two-story ADUs that are actually housing, right? It's typically over a garage, and I would argue that that's probably more the incentive of what the state bill is, is looking for. They scratched garage 
out of it because there, there apparently was an incentive to put one over a garage up until now, yeah. um, which didn't make much sense. So we got a lot of garages now with ADU sitting on top of them. Um, probably not the best use of that, that space. Yeah, so I'm, I'm concerned about the timelines in general, right? We're not getting to these conversations to make decisions that are actually affecting our decisions as a community and how they relate to these issues. Um, maybe the state will do it for us, but I think it would be important for us to, to understand where we stand as a community. <coughs> so I would argue, I mean, I, the, the ADU uh, community meeting that happened was a year is that two years ago already now? Uh, it was a year ago in September, so a year and One year ago, okay. Ago. So probably one of the you know most well-attended yeah. uh, presentations that the city put on. It's obviously a hot button for the community. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of questions out there, even the changes that we're making today. Somebody who deals in this realm pretty regularly took quite a bit of reading to really understand what's, what's going on here. Right. Um, so I think those are important issues to find ways to communicate clearly yeah. to the community. Um, so yeah, I'm in, I'm in support of the the measures that are in play, but I think we're we're not addressing sufficiently um, our non-conforming existing housing stock, and I think there's the potential um, to allow a lot of that housing to be brought into the fold easier and quicker. I don't know if we can propose some sort of a subcommittee, special committee. Do we need to get permission from the council to do that? I don't know how the procedure would play, but if there are others willing and able, I think there's a way to at least start the dialogue and, and find ways to, to bring this about quicker. What would be the charge of the subcommittee that you would need? Well, I, I, I see this discussion as very fruitful and uh, interesting to, to have, and we're just not having those. So my hope would be that it would be a continuation of these conversations that could potentially lead to proposals for different changes to our zoning code. To be more proactive rather than reactive in yes. general. Yeah. We can create our own subcommittees as, as we deem appropriate, and the, the subcommittees can inform us and Council can make use of our advice or not, right? That's correct. You have the ability to form an ad hoc subcommittee. I, I would also indicate that you know we've got a backlog of many, many amendments um, and recommendations from the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee, for example, that um, that are on our work plan, but we're we're working on. Yeah, you know, we're working on things. It, we are in a reactive mode in part because, as Sarah mentioned earlier, you know, there are staffing limitations. Um, right now, we've got two staff members working on all of the advance planning um, for the city, and many of the things are mandated things like this, and other things are priorities that uh, the council sets. And so, we um, have the ability to provide limited support to that because we, we do still need to carry out the mandates that the council has provided and to the extent that any efforts from the planning commission on a subcommittee align with the um, efforts that the council has assigned to us and prioritized for us, those could be the most beneficial. I just want to be um, clear, I understand you're offering not the suggestion that stuff we might bring up is already on this list, but rather just the concern about staff workload, right? Well, both. You know, there there may be things that where um, there are things that council has said, yes, do this, but it's in not the six month work program. It's in the twelve month uh, work program, um, and so there may be opportunities for the planning commission to to get a head start on some of that work to brainstorm and come up with ideas that um, get us moving towards the, the council objectives, the priorities that the council has set for us. Um, we, it, 
and just you know being blunt we we have limited capacity at this point to support subcommittees but we're happy to work with one and particularly provide the information um, related to the things that um, we have already in the hopper um, Sarah mentioned a number of those things, whether those are um, SRO and SOU, the, the small ownership units and single room occupancy standards that need to be updated, um, whether it's looking at detached bedrooms and potential obstacles associated with those and how those might be overcome and so forth. Um, we've, got, we've got a lot of things that are in the hopper, um, even, even small things like, um, slope modifications that uh, that take up our time um, and um, are we haven't had an opportunity to update the ordinance but there's you know dividends to pay once those ordinances are updated so that we can put in objective standards to the codes and don't have to necessarily have a permit uh, for those which frees up the planners time so lots of things yeah. as options so procedurally we can create a subcommittee whenever we want, right? I mean, it's not agendized, but like, we're up. we can just do that, right? Or do we have to agendize that and then discuss it? And I believe that you need to agendize it, um, but let me look at the bylaws. Can you, and I'll... can we on a future agenda, can you make a note to um, just agendize a conversation around proactive subcommittees and then we can go nowhere with it or somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're just one second. We're a little bit off topic, but we're informing the topic. So we're trying to inform the topic. Um, the only comment I want to make was um, any given subcommittee could. I just um, it's being thoughtful about Lee's comment about staff capacity. A subcommittee could not require any staff actually, or it could add to their burden. Um, and then what comes to mind is that you've got this housing blueprint and you've got staff here, go do a bunch of stuff. And then we reactively receive um, any number of things that council gets, uh, that staff get around to because they're working hard. And maybe the subcommittee could be in a useful, thoughtful way, finding a way to contribute to that, shape it and then drive rather than drive and, and um, prioritize because you're not going to get to all of it very quickly. So anyway, that's my thought on it. Commissioner Greenberg. I was going to say, I mean, one thing we could do in the short term would be to have a kind of uh, study group of the blueprint itself um, and sort of catch up with what you're all working on, you know, proactively. Um, is that sort of along the lines of what you're... Mm -hmm. Something like that. It could go any other directions, but I like that. I can't say that I have recall or command of the stuff or know the priority. Like, again, how long is it going to take you to get through all those things? Right. Great ideas, and we'll get them when, and just reactively <coughs> wait. Um, so thoughtful dialogue with staff about how we can contribute to that and not encumber them even more. Right, and be in support of that effort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So back to the question, um, Commissioner Schifrin, I Are you talking about subcommittees? or Yes. Um, a couple of thoughts. One, I think we are ranging off the topic that's uh, on the agenda, mm -hmm. uh, although I would agree. I wish we did have a conversation about the commission's work program and what's coming up. Um, my, I, my concern about trying to set up a subcommittee on this issue is that we'll get into the same problem that existed last year where you start talking about things, it's so actively an issue in, at the state right now that we could just be spinning our wheels. Uh, if in fact, as some of the testimony is, the state's gonna do away with owner occupancy totally, mm -hmm. then why do we need to spend a lot of time on it? Because it's not something we're gonna be able to do. So that's one concern. There's so much going on in terms of what the state's doing, what the council's doing. I'm not sure that that's should be a priority for us. The other thing is we're going to be facing, from my, my sense is, very significant issues with other state laws. I mean, SB 330 um, is going into effect soon, and that's going to affect housing development uh, overall. And I think you know, 
would assume staff is going to be coming forward with that fairly soon to sort of talk about how we're going to deal with SB 330. And then we have the rezoning of the corridors that the council has sort of given direction that that be, um, you know, that be some resolution on that. My sense is that's going to need to come to us soon as well. So I think while we've been in this kind of hiatus for a while, there are things that are uh, significant that are going to be, uh, we're going to need to spend time on. Uh, I, I totally agree that it would be desirable for the, for the commission to be more proactive than reactive all the time. Um, but I think we have to choose our battles in terms of mm -hmm. our time and staff's time uh, in ter uh, as far as what we're likely uh, to be able to, to accomplish. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that needs to be the last uh, comment on potential subcommittees or work plan. Um, and so back to the conversation about the motion before us. Uh, the question of the motion. Turn. Um, I'll keep it. I'll keep it quick because I, I mean, every it, a lot of this has already been said. Um, but I am all for easier, cheaper solutions um, to, in terms of getting the ADU, um, getting more ADUs built. That's and I, I think that's pretty much what we're um, seeing across the board. That's what's being brought down from the state. The easier, cheaper, get it done, get them built. Um, and I'm, I'm for that. Um, I think in terms of the, I'll just, I'll just make a comment about the proactive piece. I think it is important. I think we are, we were on the leading edge of the ADU and, you know, and that's, and that's what we're talking about now, but what's the next thing? I mean, there, there's something else there too. And that's, maybe that's what you're, um, potentially talking about, not just talking about like how do we continue to refine the ADU ordinance, but you know, how do we look at our at our ordinance as a whole and figure out other ways to create this housing? Um, and I think that's a great idea. And I and just based on the history of Santa Cruz and being kind of you know forward thinking around that, I think this is the um, the right place for that to happen. So um, I appreciate that comment. Um, just one uh, kind of an aside um, about parking. Um, I, for me, like one thing that I'm I struggle with is covered parking and the requirement for covered parking just within the ordinance altogether. Um, I understand that you know if you do an ADU, you can remove it, but I don't even understand why we need it to begin with. Um, with the setback for a garage being what it is, you have if you have if your requirement is two cars, you have two cars parked in the garage, and then you can also park two cars in front of the garage. So now you have four cars parked. Um, if you only need two, let's get rid of the garage entirely. Um, just park uh, uncovered, and then that gives us much more. Um, outdoor living space. We live in a in a, a climate that is just fantastic for year year round outdoor living. Um, I know that has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight, but it was just something that as we talk about parking and garages and and all that, it's just something that I think it's it, I think it should be a discussion that we have in the future. Um, I um, I would. Um, with the motion that's on the floor, I would like to um, add, I guess, a friendly amendment um, to the um, to the decimal um, question that I had. That it would be a roundup, um, and um, that's that would be my request. This is your motion, Robert. And who seconded this? I did. You did. Who Christian, seconded Christian the motion? Did. I did. <clears throat> okay. Coming. All right. So that friendly amendment is received. Favorably, is that all you had? That's it. Okay. Thank you. Vice Chair Spellman. Yeah, I just have another thought. So, I think Sarah said at the beginning of this that the, these are minimum standards too, right? It's not this is a cap on on what we could propose to council. I don't know what the added uh, feeling is here, but we could propose the owner occupancy be eliminated, uh, and we could also address existing non-conforming structures in a more direct way we want to be proactive about 
adding more housing. Do you want to offer an amendment? Yeah, I would like to add a friendly amendment. Both of those categories. You say them again? Yeah, one would be to eliminate the owner occupancy requirement for all ADUs, not just the next five year ADUs. And I'm not sure I know the right language for promoting the conversion of existing non conforming structures. Do you have an example of something that you're that hasn't been able? I mean, it sounds like you're thinking of a couple specific projects that might help us. Well, help what I'm you talking about is so th about. these. These issues are addressing just ADUs. Maybe it's not an ADU, or maybe it could fit under one of those categories. Uh, but I think it really begs to not having to bring structures up to current code in order to be I see. considered recognized structures. And I know that that's something our building department has talked about. I think there are uh, vehicles out there that would allow them to interpret things potentially more liberally and not require full adherence to code, but it's obviously something that we're not seeing happen. So AB 1226 does allow for that, and that is something that we do review in our building division on a case-by-case -case basis, is looking at the um, codes that were in place at the time the construction was, uh, it was made when we're going to do the legalization. And so uh, we also have on our work program, um, more looking at more ways to um, to really parse out all of the hundreds of units that we have and find ways to legalize those if they're barriers, particularly if they're barriers that are in our zoning regulations, we have the ability to modify those. And so that's something else that is on our work program. And certainly if the commission wanted to convey a uh, sentiment of support for that, um, then uh, that can be conveyed to the council. Cool. Yeah, that, that seems like that seems like something that could be added to the work program. It seems more like a work program item than an uh, ordinance amendment because this zoning ordinance doesn't really um, address the application of the building code. That's, you know, those are that's a separate. Those are policies and um, and other things. And I and I don't disagree that that's an important thing to get at. Um, and I don't know that the ordinance is the place to do that. The ordinance is not the place to do that. AB 1226 is state law, and we um, don't have to put anything in our ordinance to adhere to it. It is something that we uh, are adhering to just as any other state law. Offer your First Amendment then, Senator Yeah, well, I'll offer the first one. Maybe I'll come back at a future meeting with more specific um, discussion around that. So or that's received favorably, that amendment. Uh, can I ask a question? Um, is this uh, you, the owner occupied um, that you have, are putting forward? Is that for um, from January on, or are you talking retroactive to All the ADUs. I mean, are retroactive. ones that have been then one the the ones that are currently owner occupied that are within the I framework? Think everybody assumed that's where we were going to be today a year ago or mm -hmm. from January on. So I think we're, again, we're waiting and doing the minimum that the state is telling us and we're not addressing it as a community and mm -hmm. making our own decisions. Right. I think we're just, this is a way of potentially forcing that discussion quicker. Right. And going back to, and, and just taking it back to the ones that had to follow that rule and, and wiping that clean. Yes. Yeah, okay. Mr. Uh, Singleton. Also, I just touched on that on the owner occupancy rule. If new ADUs moving forward are not going to have to adhere to the rule, I think it's a little unfair that the folks who before legislation still have to adhere to the thing. So I think it's an, a matter of just treating all ADUs the same in the city. Commissioner Schiffer? Yeah. As I remember, the, this commission has already uh, recommended to the council that they remove the owner occupancy requirement, and the council refused to do it. So, uh, I think certainly it's it's the, it, at the commission's discretion. But um, it's kind of like thumbing their nose at the council. I think staff um, 
has laid out a process for looking at owner occupancy over the coming year in a way that um, looks at a number of options and will deal with this issue in a more comprehensive way. So I think it's, uh, I wanted to support the motion. I won't support the motion if it includes uh, this provision. So I would like to propo propose some amendments. I propose an amendment. Uh, I would move that the motion be amended such that if the council approves the removal of owner occupancy for all those uh, that are not subject to um, the recent state law, one of the units be uh, permanently affordable, be required to be permanently affordable. That is not friendly. That's not friendly. I think it's friendly. <laughs> okay. That's not, not favorable to received. Well, I made a motion that I don't know. I thought you were making an amendment. I'm making an amendment. I don't know if it's been seconded. So, okay, I see. So there's, I'm sorry, there's procedures. So you've made the amendment and you're. No, he did not make the amendment. Oh. He made the original motion. I'm making a, a motion to amend that. So who decides if it's a friendly amendment or not? He does. He's. He does. It's not. So okay. it's. So um, you now you're making a separate, separate motion okay. to see okay. if I get a second to the second. Okay, motion. I will second that. Okay, so I think if um, we're going to uh, increase speculation, increase housing prices uh, in the city of Santa Cruz, the least we can do is to provide affordability, uh, required affordability, to uh, as well. Question: If I, I could just clarify it, the intent of the motion is if they remove the affordability requirement on existing because moving forward for the next five years there is no uh, owner occupancy yeah for existing okay thank you state law. yeah and i would just say that given the documents that you provided that would be kind of returning to the effort that was proposed um you know during the blueprint discussion which seemed like you know a community-led conversation as well so um and you know over overwhelmingly influenced by the concern over affordability um so while it wouldn't apply to all units it would still be somewhat in in effect so i, I would support that so i've tried to be good about this but i'm confused procedurally now because we have nested motions and one of you helped me with how to properly navigate this i believe the way that it should work is that um there is <coughs> The main motion is on the floor. There is a, a separate motion to amend. There can be discussion on the uh, motion to amend and then vote on the motion to amend. And then it goes back to the main motion. Okay. All right. Any discussion around the motion to amend? Uh, Vice Chair Spellman and then yeah. Commissioner Singleton. I think uh, the state's approach is not going to require affordability requirements. And I think we've had the discussion that for ADUs, we're not, uh, we're burdening them already. Uh, and the affordability piece is yet again another burden being placed on those. So I don't think that that's a, an incentive to get the ADUs built. I think it's unfortunately the, the opposite. Mr. Singleton? Yeah, I just, I don't think you're going to see a lot of speculation as a result of the owner occupancy requirement going in. And if anything, uh, putting the affordability attachment that we've had on previously for certain concessions off of ADU hasn't resulted in a lot of AD, affordable ADUs being jumped on the market. If anything, I think it's deterred people from going through with the incentive that we wanted, to, or the action we wanted to take, which is create more affordable housing. If we wanted to create more affordable housing, I would offer them something rather than imposing something. So I think it's just the wrong approach fundamentally. So I will not be supporting the amendment. Any other discussion? Is, is what's being offered though the uh, elimination of the owner occupancy requirement. So that's the change. And it's already existing ADUs. It's not about producing new ones or incentivizing the production of new ones. It's the people who already have ADUs who, per, who wish to pursue, who wish to, you know, not have it be bound by owner occupancy. And I think by imposing an owner occupancy, or by a, we are going to retroactively allow the owner occupancy requirement to, to not apply to those units in the hopes that they create more rental units. And I think if you were to say the condition of that owner occupancy requirement being removed, uh, you have to have it get affordable. We wouldn't get the units we otherwise would get by removing the requirement anyway. 
any other discussion of the motion to amend? Well, we only have what, 700 some odd ADUs? Uh, less than that. We've, less than uh, that. I mean, well, legal ones we have just under 500, and I think illegal ones, oh, actually, maybe more than that, because illegal ones we have. So I'm really talking about right? future ADUs. I mean, there are. Aren't those already down by the state? Yes, the future ones for under the next state law, or at least for the next five years, are not subject to it. So it would only be that existing oh. ADUs would uh, lose the own. You, We'd be gaining no new ADUs, uh, potentially. Um, what we'd be getting is just a bunch of speculation in real estate. No, what we'd be getting is additional units on the market. So, so I, at I think, a higher price. I think we have some disagreement about that, and that's fine. Um, so I think we're ready to vote. vote for this. All in favor, and this is to be clear of Commissioner Schifrin's um, motion to amend. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. 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 So the motion to amend fails, and now we're back to Commissioner Singleton. No, I'd like to make another motion to amend the motion on the floor in terms of parking, and that under the development standards uh, for um, and number two on the parking, there'd be an added uh, provision that ADU shall contain adequate enclosed space to store at least one bicycle per bedroom. It's not friendly. I mean, I, I sit in the Board of Bikes, Santa Cruz County. I really want to encourage biking. I don't think adding another requirement on new housing is, is you might encourage some people to park their bike who otherwise wouldn't take the space. Otherwise, it's not clear there's a direct correlation that more people bike because they all of a sudden have more space mandated in the ADU that was created. I think it's it's just another another thing that we're adding on, and I'd rather avoid the death by a thousand cuts. I think it'd be a wonderful selling point to have on-site bike parking, but I just shouldn't think it'd be a requirement, and I think most cyclists who are looking at new transportation and looking at new housing would agree that that shouldn't be required of any individual landlord trying to build an ADU. I, Commissioner, I always think Commissioner Schifrin, would you like to make, uh, you, would you like, so it's not friendly received? Yeah, I'm making it as a motion to amend to see okay. if I get a second. Is there a second? I would need to know more about the logistics of that. Um, There's no second. Um, any other discussion of the original motion? Are there are there uh, other examples of this? I mean, are there not that I know of? Uh, let me just say one thing about parking. I I sort of turn around what um, Commissioner Singleton said uh, in terms of the contradiction between people who uh, worry about, like me, worry about parking in neighborhoods, uh, and then people who don't want parking downtown. I happen to be a person who wants parking downtown. Um, my concern is that we're, and I support increasing the, f you know, the feasibility of doing uh, accessory dwelling units. I think they are an important addition to the community and they should be supported. But I think it's important to recognize that there are some costs involved. Um, traffic in Santa Cruz is terrible. I know people who have left Santa Cruz not because they can't afford it, although there are certainly people who have left for that reason, but because they don't like the traffic. Um, we're going to lose what was um, initially historically attractive in people leaving the big cities because they wanted a more small town quality and we we're in the process of destroying that small town quality. There are reasons for doing that. There's justification for providing accessory dwelling units, but it's important to recognize that there are costs to doing that. The lack of uh, uh, parking is gonna be one of them. There's gonna be a lot more cars on the streets in the neighborhood. And the, you know, the whole nature of the community is going to change. For a university community, maybe that should be expected, that we're going to have a lot more young people around, a lot fewer families. But I think it's important to take that into consideration, that the community is changing. And as we um, try to adjust to these changes, which is going to mean a lot more housing, not any wider streets, uh, not any uh, greater number of parking spaces, there are going to be costs to the community. Uh, there are already costs to the community in terms of the density that we have. 
So I think the proposal I made was trying to not just give a lip service to, yes, I support bicycles, yes, I support more multimodal transportation, but what are we really doing to get it, uh, to make it happen, to encourage people to um, create, to actually use different um, different means of transportation. Not providing parking spaces, I've seen no evidence that that really works in terms of reducing the number of cars people have. So, um, Is there anything that exists? So we've, we've all spoken uh, at length, and I'm, I don't know that I'm doing a great job of driving the agenda. Um, so I'm going to call for a roll call vote. Commissioner Schifrin? I'm going to vote. Uh, I guess I'm going to vote no, but I'd like the record to show that I would have voted yes if it wasn't for the owner occupancy require uh, the only owner occupancy provision. I'm sorry, um, you have a question, Lee. I, I was asking, is this the amendment that uh, uh, did? There was no amendment. Did you get a second? second. Get a thank second. you. So, yeah. Thank you. So what, did you? Did I kind of interrupted you because Lee had a question? Did you get your um, qualification <laughs> stated? I got my qualification stated. I don't know if it was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Spellman? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Singleton? Aye. Chair Pepping? Aye. So the motion passes uh, five to one, and that was our only agenda item, so our meeting is adjourned. Thank you to members of the public who endured the long meeting and came to speak.